And we're live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to another special show today. Um, we've got Jerry, Jerry, um, Jerry, uh, Jerry Gray um, from uh, from <laughs> from China. Take yeah, where am I from? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're from China, but you're originally from uh, Australia and Britain, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was born in Britain. Um, born my in first, Britain. first 28 years there, then 17 in Australia, and then the last. It's coming up to 20. A few months, it'll be 20 years here. Anna, can you hear Jerry, by the way? No, I can't. I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, I see. Is it? Um, yeah. Okay, hang on a second. Come on, Jerry, we need to hear the fucking <laughs> mic at work. Jerry, can you say I something? Can I can hear. Oh, that's better. Yeah, I can, yeah, I heard, I heard Jerry say that. Okay, um, hang on a second. Jerry, another test, testing one, two, three? Yeah, testing one, two, three. Okay, perfect. All right, so we can we can start. Um, and Anna, Anna, you can you're welcome to kind of um, jump in whenever you want if you want. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, Jerry, welcome on board. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, Yellen, and we know she's um, she made a trip to China, and she made a couple of controversial um, statements. Um, number one, she said that China's oh, being over doing over 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 capacity, and um, second thing she she was threatening China about um, not you know helping Russia. Yep. And um, the third thing she wanted was probably uh, China to buy bonds because America's struggling at the moment. And um, I, I don't know about you, Jerry, but it seems like she was doing Blinken's job. I mean, she's only like. Um, Treasury Secretary. So why is she going around threatening China and talking about overcapacity, talking about Russia? And it seems like she's doing Blinken's job. But it seems like they sent her to do the dirty work. What's what's your thoughts about this? Um, yeah, dirty work is probably a good word for it. But uh, let, let's be honest, she's in her late 80s. I think she's 87, 88 years of age. And, and so she they knew that she, just like Kissinger did, would get treated with a great deal of respect. Uh, I wrote an article which was published actually in Pearls and Irritations in Australia, which basically the article was called Janet Yellen came to China and China was polite. And that's effectively the, 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 the feeling that I got from talking to my Chinese friends. I've spoken to a couple of Chinese journalists about this. She came with a couple of uh, diktats. She she had some ideas that China is at overcapacity in three different products, which is completely untrue. Um, if they were overcapacity on electric cars, for example, then they wouldn't be still selling them at a profitable price and making a lot of money. They, I mean, China's electric car industry is bigger than, I think, probably the rest of the world combined. But certainly, uh, BYD is the biggest. It's bigger than Tesla now. And so the the idea of being over capacity is completely wrong. It's not. The other one was solar panels. And once again, certainly yep. they're not over capacity because China has a huge capacity for this these products, the solar panels, but the rest of the world still has a hunger for them. So there's the whole of Australia, the whole of most of Asia, most of Africa, and much of Central and South America, and even North America and Canada, where uh, solar panels have a very small footprint right now. Yet there's, let, let's take a look at Australia, for example. There are cities in the desert. Let's look at Alice Springs. You could put solar panels, you could put fields and fields and fields of solar panels, and it would not affect agriculture. It would not affect any industry whatsoever. It would just provide completely free power to the, to this, to the city of Alice Springs. So 25,000 people live there. It's not a big city, but they could be completely, totally, and 100% solar panels. So how can you say we're at overcapacity when the whole 
uh, uh, bear in mind one or less than a year ago, eight or nine months ago, she was here and she was saying China needs to do more towards greening and the uh, global climate change type thing. So effectively what she said eight or nine months ago and what she said this trip are completely at odds with each other. Now, in the case of lithium batteries, for sure, China is 20 years ahead of America in terms of its development and energy storage capacity. So Chinese batteries are literally killing the market anywhere else. And that's not China's fault. China has invested billions into doing this. And Janet Yellen has been managing an economy where they have invested virtually nothing. And they are literally at least 10. And I, I, I cited a report that said they were at least 10 and as much as 20 years behind China in terms of their development of uh, energy storage. So lithium ion batteries are definitely flooding the market in America because people want storage of their power. And of course, there's no other storage than Chinese. So yeah, in that respect, she was right. So they're going to put uh, tariffs on various different things. They're going to change the way that it's done. And basically what it means is Americans will pay more for any product that comes out of China. And that will affect American America's economy in a negative way. We all know sanctions don't help. So it will affect the American economy in a negative way. It will affect their inflation. Uh, when their inflation stays high, so do their interest rates. When their interest rates stay high, people leave their money in the banks and don't spend it. So therefore, they have a, a an overcapacity and an inflationary problem. It's a, it's a really difficult position to be in. I don't know how they're going to fix it. I really don't. Is it a case of... America being under capacity rather than China being over capacity. I would I would prefer to describe it as underperforming, but I did use the word in the article I wrote, I used the word under capacity, but I would suggest it's more underperforming. It is too expensive to build something in America right now. So they may be decoupling from China, they may describe it as de-risking from China, but the bottom line is they cannot completely uh, cut China's supply chain out of their product range. They cannot do that. It's just not going to be possible. So the, the situation that they're left with now is that they're exporting, sorry, importing from places like Panama, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, and those, those countries, and also places like Thailand and Malaysia for their solar panels. They're getting many solar panels from Thailand and Malaysia, but they're not cutting China out of the supply chain. They can drop off the made in China label, but they cannot cut China out of the supply chain because all of those products are coming from China. China is the source. I mean, you know, we've got one and a half billion people almost here, and there's also a massive amount of resources. And China has developed the things, the minerals and the rare earths, the rare earths that are needed to create these products on an industrial scale. So they're not going to cut this out. So their pricing structure in America is now going to be higher because they're tariffing, they're putting tariffs or even blocks, sanctions and blocks. Uh, there was a load of German cars held up. I don't know whatever was the result of it, but a shipload of German cars were held up because some of the aluminium or aluminum, as they call it, was um, sourced in Xinjiang. And Xinjiang, according to them, and it is it is a lie. It's not misinformation. It's an absolute lie. According to the American government, there are risks of forced labor in that region. I, I assure anybody who wants to listen, there are no risks of forced labor in Xinjiang because the, the laws in China are very strong about that. Do you think it's... Um, it's oh, I, I think... Um, yeah, go on. Go on, Anna. failing. The system is no longer working, we're at the end of this cycle, uh, uh, we're into late capitalism. So, for example, if they did bring um, manufacturing back to America, you have a situation where an iPhone, which would no longer ha have um, the cheaper labour and the economies of scale, would end up costing something like 6,000 bucks, which, you know, who could consume that so the whole balance is completely um, out of kilter so they have to keep saying these things and the contradiction between, between 
um, Janet Yellen saying, oh, you've got to do more about uh, 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 about poll- pollution, world, world pollution, and knowing that America has for 160 years or more, with the rest of the, the West, been pumping out these um, carbon emissions ever since the, their industrial revolutions. It's it, hypocritical. I mean, this... I think, it's, I think it's to satisfy the fossil fuel. Uh, Anna, uh, sorry to stop you there for a second. Is it possible you can log into the stream yard? Because we're having very, um, we're finding it very difficult to hear you because um, from the phone to the YouTube, it's like very poor, but from it's, it's easier the other way, if, if that makes sense. Right, so, so, I, I, shall, I shall do that. So carry on, Jack, and I'll just get this done. Yes. So if, if you lo- log in, I'll, I'll, if you log into the Streamyard link I sent yeah. you, then you can, then okay. you don't need to put the camera on. You can just come on. And, uh, okay. No, it's, it's, okay. Yeah, because we we can't hear you very well. Jerry can't hear you. All right. Okay. 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 Yeah, it is look quite difficult to hear. But I heard what Anna said there about the hypocrisy relating to the. Um, uh, carbon uh, emissions. China China produces 30% of all of the world's goods, and yes, it does have a higher carbon footprint than most other countries, but looked at it on a per capita basis, it's lower than the United States, it's lower than Canada, it's lower than Australia. China, I, I look out of my window on a daily basis and I see blue skies. It's a much cleaner place than it once was. Certainly it's cleaner than it was when I arrived here. And consequently, China is doing the right thing. We know this for a fact in terms of its carbon footprint. China is doing the right thing. So what what they're suggesting China needs to do, China are already 20 years ahead of America. Anna's back. Hi, yeah, I'm just trying to... um... Much better. Yeah, much better. Right, I'm I'm trying because I'm getting a double. So I think I've got two two things on. So I think I'm going to have to get rid of uh, the you. Right. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Very we can well. hear you. Yeah. Oh, why have I got this echo? I've got. It, it's probably the phone. Maybe you can uh, mute the phone or something. No, no. That I've I've actually. Um, uh, right, I, I've taken Twitter off. So I, I oh, anyway, carry on while I work this out, chaps. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I was going to say that, do you find this like hypocritical coming out of the US? Because the US has been like targeting China for, for a long time now, ever since the Trump um, sanctions and obviously... Biden has carried it on. They, they've sanctioned companies like Huawei. They sanctioned like thousands of Chinese companies, put them on the um, blacklist or some sort of entity list, or, I think mm-hmm. it's called. Yeah. Um, Chinese companies are not allowed to buy semiconductors, the high-end ones, and loads of other sanctions. Um, and they don't, they don't play on the even playing field. I mean, Janet Yellen talks about, oh, we want to play on the even playing field only when it suits them. And um, but when it doesn't suit them, they want um, they want China to play on the even um, playing field. So she was going around. Yeah. Wait, so you she, think this is the, 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 this is like you know white men speak with forked tongue. The whole yeah. of the Anglosphere has just gone completely nuts. So they'll say one thing when they mean absolutely the opposite. You know. So from from trying to enlist China, obviously, into the battle against climate change, which is what we were supposed to have been doing for for several years before Trump and Biden got, you know, sucked into this China hate. I think the whole China hate, apart from obviously they're trying to kill the golden goose and it seems like a Viking raiding party to me that they're trying to carve up the, the wealthy nation but also at home for the domestic audience this is a massive um diversion from the fact that their system is going very very wrong this is no longer serving american people the top one percent we know own as much as the bottom 90 percent. we can see the effects this is happening in all the awful videos that are, are coming in of the homeless and you know the, the the drug problems that they have so they're incredible social problems then janet yellen 
goes to to Ch China and uses this. I think it's a euphemism, this overcapacity. And I think you know Jerry touched on this that what it really means is it's not working for us. So we need you as a, as a vassal state to come and just prop us up like it's the Hunger Games and we're the capital in the centre and you're just one of the districts and this is your function. So I'm 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 pleased that people are seeing through it because the overcapacity term is joining the memes that we laugh at, like, but at what cost? You know, that it's another term that they can fling out and um, a, a, a dog whistle term that gets all sorts of interesting results from uh, Americans. So where is the climate change fight that was supposed to have been on that America and China was supposed to be fighting this? The, the fossil fuel industries must be licking their lips. You know, all I see everywhere, whether it's um, embroiling Guyana and Venezuela in, in, into a, a new battle because there's Exxon has found huge oil reserves off the coast of Venezuela and um, the bit of Venezuela that Brit Brit British imperialism carved up in British Guiana. Um, to the oil reserves we see off the coast of Gaza now and that awful pier that has been made from rubble and literally the bones of, of Palestinian people. So the whole thing is a nightmare. We're being sucked into America's nightmare and the the press are just part of this. Um, yeah, I would like to see solar panels absolutely mm. everywhere but America's not going to profit from it. And that's what comes first. And they're quite happy to take the whole world um, down. And yes, she is doing Blinken's job. But if you remember last time, Blink Blinken went to China and it looked as if there was a glimmer of hope. He came back and that got sabotaged by Biden immediately saying she is a dictator. Yeah, I, I remember when uh, Blinken went to Anchorage and he started... Um, talking down on the Chinese and I think he thought he was a bit clever and uh, he didn't expect a, a Chinese fight back on the day <laughs> and I don't know if you remember uh, this was like four years ago in the beginning of the administration I remember that America laid on instant noodles <laughs> for the Chinese to, to show exactly what they thought of them and given that you know the, the Chinese diplomatic corps they have some of the best Food, along with the French, the French and the Chinese food is, is reckoned to be absolutely the best. So for them to suddenly serve instant noodles, I think was just cheap, nasty, aggressive, spiteful. You know what's happening to these people? Yeah, uh, my understanding was that they didn't provide instant noodles; they provided nothing, and the Chinese delegation had to go and get their own instant uh, noodles. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, that's right. That's what I heard as well. Yeah, and. Uh, they they had lunch, but they they were they all fireworks were going off, so they were had it on separate rooms or something, and um, yeah, and they had to get their own noodles because they were scared they they might get poisoned or something. <laughs> yes, there is that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I remember that. But talking of food, I think Janet Yellen last time she went, um, there was a big article about her eating ma magic mushrooms or something. Yeah, and there was uh, all it was all over the paper. She was um. She was nodding her head like she was um, greeting the Japanese because she was bowing. I think she um, she got confused with the Chinese with the Japanese, and she was uh, bowing her head. And obviously, <laughs> that's not like a <laughs> that's not a Chinese custom. So she she couldn't oh. stop bowing her head. So they made the they made absolutely fool. They made her into a fool because of that. I thought it was just hilarious, really. Even even when she landed on the plane this time, you can see her trying to bow, but she I think she was trying to stop herself. I could see some clips. She was um, trying not to bow, but she's she, she was doing it. It'd be interesting to see if she visits another country. Maybe she goes to Canada or if she goes to Europe, whether she bows to them. Maybe that is just her way. I've never noticed that. But certainly when she meets Chinese officials, she does have a, a very distinctive bow to them that's it's something that she does it gets commented on in social media here too her food was more important than her message absolutely <laughs> and and a lot of people in the west 
were kind of a little disappointed about this. The fact was she had no message to bring that was worthy of listening to. So yeah. what she was wearing, what she ate, where she went, who she saw, it was much more important than what she did and what she said. So that that's why, again, I say China were polite to her, but nothing will change. I'm, I'm not sure that there was ever a requirement for the um, buying treasury bonds. China has already... Even if it hasn't told her so, they've already indicated quite clearly that by, by their actions that they're not doing that. They're selling bonds. And also there's a couple of senators who are proposing that uh, that the U.S. reneges on them anyway. So why would China even think about buying them when you've got vocal senators who are quite important people in their own li lifetimes anyway, uh, telling telling the world that we're going to make China pay for something that happened 100 years ago. It's a, it's a very odd story. Exactly. If, um, you look at the, if you look at the body language, I mean, I think that's quite important that it, it's an indication that she knows deep down that China is important. Mm. So you, you've got people being pulled in several directions and these contradictions are coming up and biting them on the bum. And, and the press just, you know, have their narrative that they uh, carry on with. But I think it's quite in interesting that venerable old Janet Yellen goes there. And you and you can see, because she's not going arrogantly, you can imagine if um, Nancy Pelosi went, went there, that it would be um, a completely different story. But even when Blinken went there, there was um, respect as opposed to what happened in Alaska, you know, when they thought that they they were good, you know, they acted like sports jocks that um so, so arrogant so i think they do know and i'm wondering what they they talk about how they talk talk about china behind closed doors because what they're giving to their domestic audience and the world audience is just completely different from the reality which which we know it's like it's the american dream that is absolutely mm. the american delusion now and they're trapped in this. We've been nailed. The UK has found itself nailed to the USS Titanic as it goes down, and we're we're expected to be torpedoing our global lifeboat. The same with um, Australia that has just gone nuts. The whole of the Anglosphere are now dragging in, um, you know, the, the the rest of the developed West. France was holding out for a bit. Germany is just. I mean, I don't understand. Jerry, do you know about this? Schultz is, is going over to China, so, you know. Yep. Yeah, he's on his way over here. But the, the thing about Germany is that many German corporations have gone against the grain. Uh, BASF, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, VW, BMW, those corporations are here. BASF just invested literally tens of billions of U.S. dollars in Guangdong. They, they, I think, I, I'm not 100% certain of this, but I believe they're moving their global headquarters to Guangdong. So they, they have, they're really here for the, for the, uh, for the duration, uh, BASF, that is. VW have set up places inside of Xinjiang. Um, Porsche are in China. A lot of German corporations are building products here. They're selling products from here to other markets as well. The, one, of, one of the largest markets for Mercedes-Benz in China is actually Kazakhstan, funnily enough. So Kazakhstan has a free trade agreement with Russia. So Germany can't sell Mercedes-Benz to Russia, but China can, but not, and it's not, China is not directly selling to Russia. They, they actually have, um, this is another of Yellen's um, uh, warnings, if you like, don't get involved with Russia. China has actually stepped back from dealings with Russia. There is a massive amount of trade going on between the two countries, and for sure it is bigger than it used to be. But China is is avoiding anything that can be considered uh, dual purpose. So they can sell cars. The DJI, the, the big drone company, it refuses to sell to either Russia or to uh, Ukraine. It's not selling to either, either country. But of course, Ukraine is getting all of these products from other countries. And I believe that Russia is probably getting them from uh, Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, one of the Eurasian Economic Union. There he um, we, is. Yeah, we, we've got um, about 230 listeners so far. So right. everyone everyone that's listening, can you make sure you like and share? It uh, helps with the algorithm. And um, 
and put a comment in as well. Um, so it really, really helps. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, go to David Cameron, um, Anna, because um, so so this is what what I I don't know if you remember this. This is um, UK putting sanctions on China, and and if you notice this clip, um, I don't know if you can uh, see the clip on your laptop, on your PC, Anna. But um, yes, yes, I can. If you notice this clip, it's almost like he's a hostage, basically reading out lines. Is forced to read out lines because. David Cameron was actually had very good relations with um, President Xi and also with China when he was prime minister. But but now it seems like he's forced to do this speech. And if you look at his body language and the way he's talking, it's almost like a hostage has got a gun to his head and he's basically forced to read out some lines. And let's, let's listen to this. Attacks on our democracy are unacceptable. Yet that is what organizations backed by China have done. Today, we are publicly calling them out, and we've taken action. We've summoned the Chinese ambassador, and we are putting sanctions, travel bans, asset freezes on the individuals and the group responsible. So, so basically, while the, the, world leader, the, the world leaders are going to China, you've got Schultz going, you've got Yellen going, you've got you know, all these other leaders are going, but Britain is uh, busy putting sanctions on China as, as they would do. <laughs> What's your thoughts on this? Well, if you remember 2010, there was a complete reversal by the UK government. You know, there's that famous photo of them all wearing poppies and there was the argument about what poppies re represented. You know, was it was it ab about British remembrance or was it the, the Opium Wars? But after that, they came back and that started the so-called golden age with China for Britain. And... Um, you know, trade was was up. And I sort of relaxed at that point, more or less, because I thought, well, it's a, you, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's a change. It's a positive change. The uh, hawks like, I don't know, Niall Ferguson and various academics and people who were pushing the Obama um, pivot to China seemed to be uh, marginalised. And we got on with this. And it was just so sensible. Um, it, it coincided with a period of, you know, cheap food, cheap, cheap everything. It seemed that, you know, apart from a few pockets um, of conflict in the world that we were heading towards peace, everything was great. But then you had the declining hegemon glowering in the corner and who didn't quite like this. But for Britain, I think there's a strand of the establishment that has been really resentful ever since they had to hand over the... Hong Kong back to China in 1997. So, for example, you, you have um, Chris Patton, who was not only the head of the BBC, but he was the last governor of China, writing the foreword to um, uh, Joshua Wong's book. So I think they've been lurking in the background. And the way I see it is Iago um, dripping poison into, into Othello's ear and I think when, um, as I say in my shakedown book, which should should be out soon, you, you you look at Obama, who was really knew nothing about China when when he came uh, along in twenty when when was he elected to two thousand and eight? He knew very little about uh, China. He was focusing on the Middle East. He got embroiled in this argument for Copenhagen. Copenhagen is a very important pivotal point in sending Obama a bit insane. And you had Britain and persuading America to take a certain stand at COP15, which was in um, at the end of 20, 2009, uh, the exposure of the, the Danish the, the Danish text, which showed that there was a conspiracy for all the wealthy nations to stitch up the poorer nations. So I'm writing about this, that this will be in Shakedown. There's a bit of it on my Shakedown page at my my website. And it's after that he was so humiliated, and it was Britain who was encouraging him to, to, to do this, that he then goes, um, he goes for this pivot the following year. So he and Hillary basically, you know, change the whole course of uh, the course of history by going for this pivot. And I think, um, so, so there's this strand in the background that's dripping poison in America's ear. You've got Cameron who comes along and he's persuaded 
um, along with Vince Cable and uh, Osborne, who, who went to China, that, yes, this is the future. And even Boris Johnson could see, you know, dollar signs or yuan signs in their eyes because the, the Johnson family have quite a lot of investments in in China. So that's going ahead well. Wall Street is following. Wall Street is doing very, very, very well. And their corporations are making about half their profits from the sales and services in China. But then you've got this chipping away, this steady chipping away. Um, you've got the military, um, the, the military industrial complex, you've got fossil fuels in the background. And Republican, Republican um insane people who will who want who they know their economy is on the slide and they're no longer going to be um great and the, the dominant force that they once were and i think they see china as this golden goose seeing all the wealth those beautiful futuristic cities all the high speed rail the great profits that are being made and i think they're looking at china and saying well why isn't that us and I think everything sort of flows from there. And um, as you say, with you know, back to David Cameron, looking at that, he he looks like a hostage, doesn't he? It, it's he does. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. And shame on him because his legacy, the one good thing he did was to get China on yeah. board and the UK going ahead in, in unison, which I think he should have been applauded, applauded for. And here he is doing this. That's right. I mean, I don't understand why they didn't get Liz Trust to do this or cleverly to do this. I think they um they had it easy. They they got um they knew um David Cameron had a good uh, or should I say Lord Cameron, he had a good relationship with China. And it's almost like they're forcing him to do it. They're saying, show us your loyalty and you know, <laughs> say this about China and uh I think he has more. He carries more weight because there there is this history of the golden age. Yeah, um, I know there's green sill. They've managed to. I think they're holding that. That's one of the things they're holding over him. There's probably other stuff that we don't even know about. Um, but green sill is is certainly one thing that they keep threatening ro ro rolling out. That's the sword of Damocles hanging over his head. But with trust, I mean, who would? Trust them. I think she's our period of fascism, maybe in the next generation. I, I don't rule out her being um, rolled out as the British leader when we, when we get when fascism really comes out of this nascent period. And if, if it takes off, then I can see her heading it up. But for now, no, that he, he has the weight, House of Lords and all that. I can't believe Lord Cameron would do something like this because um he should know better he should actually say to the to, to the ruling class he goes hang on guys we need to work with china here we need we need to build a good relationship we need to uh, you know build on trade let's not do let's not place any sanctions and stuff but he just went ahead and did it i mean what's your thoughts sherry i mean I, I'm, it seems strange it's very hard for me to add anything when Anna has been so comprehensive there. And she also was far more eloquent than I could be. Um, I believe, my understanding is that Cameron was brought back into the House of Lords. He was given an appointment into the House of Lords. Now, bear in mind, these are not elected representatives. These are nominated. They're approved by the, uh, by the, the realm. So you've got Rishi Sunak, who was, not, who was not democratically elected, appointing or nominating uh, David Cameron, who was out of politics and therefore no longer democratically elected, and being appointed and, and anointed by the King Charles, who was also not democratically elected, telling <laughs> China that democracy is important. Now, you, you you just can't make this stuff up because in you know all of these people who sit in the House of Lords, I think eighty of them were born to the role, and seven hundred of them were appointed by the king, anointed by the king, and about 45 of them were uh, are uh, bishops and archbishops who who gain it as, as a kind of a promotional thing. When they become a, an archbishop, they can enter the House of Lords. So, And then you've got some who are judges. Now, they're obviously qualified in matters of law, but none of them are elected. And they're telling China, you know, your democracy is all wrong. And I'm looking at this and going, what the hell are you talking about? Not not one of you people has ever been elected. 
I mean, David Cameron was, you're, uh, Anna is absolutely right, he was responsible for what we called the golden age. He and Xi Jinping drank a pint of beer together. It was, a, a, it was an epic moment. And it should have been, when he came back, my first thought was, oh, thank God Rishi Sunak has done something good. And within a week of him coming back, he was threatening China. He was postulating on China and pontificating on China. And consequently, he's, he's gone right down in my estimation. I thought he was the right guy for the job because the, uh, what do they call him, the, the head of the Territorial Army, Territorial Army Catering Department, James Cleverly certainly wasn't. I mean, that guy is just a yeah. joke, as far yeah. as I was concerned. Well, before him, he was Liz Truss. So. <laughs> yeah. well, let's not go there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, what what is the point of coming back if you're going to make statements like this against China? I mean, he could have just stayed in the background. He left with his head held high after Brexit. Mm -hmm. He quit basically, and he 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 went he went off on a high. And yeah. uh, now he comes back as, um, as somebody who's, he's not even a prime minister anymore. He's obviously uh, the foreign secretary. But he's, 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 it's like, you know, if you're a boss of a company, but you're coming back as a worker, but then yeah. you're forced to do stuff, you're forced to clean the toilets and stuff because you're not the boss anymore. And this is exactly yeah, Effectively, what he's the former CEO coming back as a sales rep. That's yeah. what we've got. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, mm -hmm. And the way he was, I mean, his body language, the way he's, the way he's standing still, he's looking straight at the camera. Uh -huh. You can see there's no emotion. He's, he's almost like he doesn't want to do it, but he's... It's he's like he's, AI. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he was AI. <laughs> <laughs> How will we know? Deep fake. You never know. Um, I'm going to show you the... Um, Another slide, actually. Um, should we should we move on to this um, uh, question that you have up here, which is the uh, how do we see the space race unfolding? Yeah, I was going to go into that actually. Let's hang, okay. hang on. Already. Hang I on. Thought you'd forgotten. Um, but I wanted to. Um, the setup is very clear, by the way. I do like this um, streamyard, so I've got my mm -hmm. eye on this. I might. I might use this in future yeah it's pretty Great. good, it's okay. pretty good. Yeah. um so you I've can got, have a free account but uh, if you pay 25 dollars a month you get to use your own logo and a couple of other features oh right that's clear nice and clear so, so I wanted to talk about this uh, British article really and um when I when I saw this I I, I must admit I almost fell off my seat uh, I almost died laughing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so those of you who can't hear or see the screen, I'll, I'll read it out for you. How China could paralyze Britain and kill thousands by hacking onto your electric car, locking you in, inside and creating deadly traffic jams. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the best of British journalism there. <laughs> Can we not use the Daily Mail and journalism in the same <laughs> sentence, please? Not without a negative. Yeah, I just I, I just wanted to put this out there because it's just so ridiculous. I mean, who would who in the right minds would write something like this? I just uh, it's beyond me. But I want to kind of um, speak some stats with you guys. Um, BYD in UK. Um, in terms of percentage, is right at the bottom when it comes to EV cars. Number one is Kia, number five uh, percent. Um, out of all the cars in UK, five percent of the cars are Kia cars, and uh, second is Hyundai, which is another Korean car, and that is like four point eight percent. Third is Toyota, which is Japanese. So you got the top three companies selling EVs in Britain. Uh, and BYD is right at the bottom, selling right 0.5% of EV cars in Britain. So they are basically, um, when Janet Yellen says overcapacity, when you look at the figures, you know, there are there isn't many Chinese EV cars in UK or in America. You know? I mean, no. um, the, the top cars being sold in, in UK is uh, Kia, which is Korea, Japan. So my question is, why don't why don't they have any issues, like um, buying Korean cars and Japanese cars? Why why do they have issues buying Chinese cars? Well, I mean, what's the what's the difference? I mean, the only difference I can see is Chinese cars are better quality and cheaper. 
I mean, what what, what is all this, um, you know, anti-Chinese stuff going on? Where you know they they don't look at um, they, they they let basically Japan and Korea get away with murder, and they won't say anything to them. But when it comes to China, it's just um, attack. You know, it's, cr it's crazy. Anna goes first. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm just putting a, a link up actually in the comments to, to a piece that I wrote on the, the, the total absurd um, campaign. It's like they're trying to outdo themselves. I'm wondering if these people, you know, they're obviously, obviously some of these have taken the um, Joe Biden China hate bounty of 500 uh, million a year. Although I think, Jerry, you've actually said it's uh, worked out that it's more than 500 a year. But they're doing this, and I'm wondering if they have some sort of behind-the-scenes bets. Who can come up with the most absurd story and actually have it make headlines and have people believe it? Because we're now in the, you know, we ain't in Kansas anymore. We're just in this completely strange nightmare realm. I don't know. It's like part purge, part, you know, part Oz. I, I, I just don't, don't know. It's um, they. The thing is, again, it, it's a, a huge distraction from the fact that we are getting poorer. We they're trying to stop us having access to the cheap and good, you know w well constructed goods that are coming out of China that we can no longer um, compete with. So they're trying to get this emotional response every time. So you only have to mention China. And I see this, you know, sometimes you 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 might be looking uh, for something, I don't know, on the that behemoth Amazon, and you'll see someone comment, oh, I see this is made in China. Where can I get something that, that's not made in China? And, of course, we know the supply chains. All they're doing is moving some of the supply chains out of China. It's still, you know, China's still in the supply chain it's just that the the um the, the top name you know the location is is no longer china so you can say well this is made in vietnam but you know actually it goes goes back and of course it's china um business knows this because business yeah. is just going for their for their buck so you've got the ideology of the imploding hegemon um and you know and this class, there is this awful class that goes across all of the countries. And unfortunately, there's no resistance. You know, you get like, you know, Jerry was saying in the, in, in Germany that the, these companies, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and, and uh, they are staying in in China. But you've got this terrible ideological and psychological war going going on that is stopping the population from being able to organise, to an, a, analyse what's going on and saying we are being wrecked because of this elites, because of that, what our elite want, want, wants to happen. So I think the whole thing is nuts. But yeah, this this article that, that I, I wrote, it's garlic. They did Chinese garlic, the, uh, the Chinese battery. Um, and a, and a whole load of, of goods, the, the cranes, that's another one, isn't it? Um, yeah, the, yeah. the um, ship, ship unloading cranes, yeah. Yeah, so there's this whole ridiculous um, line of goods that we are not supposed to want to buy anymore. They're, they've uh, wrecked Apple. I think Apple's going down because you're not supposed to buy Apple because they're, they're making stuff um, in China. Tesla, I think, is uh, feeling the pinch as well. Well, Apple and Tesla are feeling the pinch for a different reason. Um, both of them are made in China, that's true, but neither of them are suffering the, because they're both American-owned. I don't know, Musk is South African, but he's American um, green card or citizen, I'm not sure. They're, they're, they're not feeling the pinch for the same reason. The difference is that with those two corporations is that they've driven costs down and kept margins up. So both of them have a situation whereby they're, they're not just ripping off the, the, the workers in their factories who they pay less or in the case of um, of Musk, he's replaced most of his workers with robots and or, automation, and and that's that's the that's not a bad thing. That that's a thing that's happening. But where he saved the costs, he hasn't passed that saving on to uh, onto the public. So he's now struggling because BYD and the like, and, and there are over a hundred, believe it or not, uh, models of Chinese electric car. 
they're 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 passing on the cost savings so that's why they're cheaper it's it's all about profitability now and if if anybody doubts me go take a look at the publicly declared profit and loss statements and you will see that apple and tesla are up there as the most profitable country companies in the globe now how do you get to be the most profitable and that's by driving your cost down and keeping your margins up these two things are incompatible in china you can't do that you can but you don't. And if you do, you'd be out of business. It's just too competitive. So in America, people are saying, well, if you want to buy an American car that's an EV, you basically have to have this Tesla because it's American. And if you want to buy an American phone, you can only buy an Apple. So therefore, people say, I want to buy an American phone without realizing that most of the profit is, is a consumer ripoff. The profit margin on that phone is 30, 40, 50 percent. And, and what China's getting out of it is probably less than 7 percent. So there's, there's that. Now, the other thing is the is the threat. This is the biggest problem, the threat. It's all a case of what could happen. Now, what could happen is Huawei could spy on you. They don't, but they could. Uh, BYD could switch off. DJI could switch off or monitor things that they shouldn't. They could, but they don't. Now, this is a case of do you trust your government? And in China, people do. That's an actual fact, and it's it's not my, my comment. This has come from Harvard University, San Diego University, the Edelman Trust Barometer. Chinese people trust their government. When the government says, we won't be monitoring you, we will just be collecting this data, uh, to, to provide better, or the company says we're collecting this data to provide you a better service. The government says, "Well, you better bloody do that because if you don't, we're going to prosecute you." Chinese data is protected. We have privacy protection here in China that you don't have. The protection in America is protection for the people who own the software. The protection in China is for the people who use the software. Very, very different situation. And so, it's a question of trust. Do you think that Tesla has the ability to switch off every single Tesla at the flick of a switch? If the answer to that is yes, then that's why they think BYD could do the same thing. I'm 100% certain they couldn't, but I'm 100% certain they could build it in if they wanted to. They just haven't done that. Now, unless someone comes up with evidence to say that I'm wrong, no one has come up with evidence to say that they are right. And that's the important thing. Allegations do not constitute evidence. That's what people forget. I've just put on another article. Um, yeah. It looks like uh, rather than putting tariffs on Chinese cars and goods, they're looking to outright ban um, uh, Chinese EVs from United States. And okay, can I correct you there, AJ, because they're not. This is the BBC. Yeah. I, I can assure you the BBC are the world's biggest misinformation organization. Uh, maybe maybe the CIA are bigger, I don't know. But mm -hmm. Biden is urged. If you read that article, you will see who is urging, urging Biden to do this. This is not Biden considering this. This yeah. is probably some consumer groups such as the civil libertarians saying, we think this should happen. This is how the BBC creates this misinformation. Biden is urged to ban China-made electric vehicles. Biden is not planning to do anything of the sort. What he will probably do is put a tariff. They've already got a 2.5 and a 25% tariff. 2.5 on all foreign-built cars, 25% on Chinese-built cars already. So they're planning on another tariff on that or some restrictions. But the bottom line is, they could fix this problem very, very simply by saying, send us the car and we'll put the chip in it. Simple as that. It, yep, it, yep. We can build the cars here, but the chip mm -hmm. is an American chip built in America. And most of them <laughs> are. <laughs> exactly. And this leads me to my next um, question, really. And I wanted to kind of talk to Anna because she knows a lot about this. This is going to be about the um, opium wars. So with um one thing that uh, well a couple of um, companies that us has banned is huawei and they're looking to ban tiktok obviously um they've given a deadline and if you know if they don't force that sale then they look they might look to ban it but who knows i think they've extended it from last i heard and by the time trump comes in 
he already said that he doesn't want to ban some, you know, I think TikTok might get away with it. But the whole point is, I think they are using the same tactics as they did during the opium wars, where the US is basically forcing terms to the Chinese. And um, it's very, very similar to that. What's your thoughts, Anna? Well, I've been saying for a few years now that they are aiming for an Opium Wars 3. Um, you know, it is carving up a, a, a country. The, the, the difference before, in, in the... So what happened at, at the end of the 18th century is that Britain sent um, a delegation, George McCartney, to try and get trade going. And, and we, we had, like, various clockwork doodads, you know, clocks and scratchy wool. Uh, but we couldn't compete against the silks and the, the beautiful stuff that was coming out of coming out of China. You know, we had their their, their tea, their um the I think there was spices there as well, lacquer, which is the first plastic. Um so you had all these goods coming out coming out of China porcelain and there's a reason why it was called China you know, um, our crockery, because it all came from there. So technologically, the, the Chinese are way ahead. You know, they also had hydraulics and siege drills and metal stirrups way way before any anyone else that, that um, transformed world history. So they go to China and the emperor says, oh, we don't need your stinking <laughs> goods. You know, why do we need your your scratchy wool when we've got uh, we've got the, the, this silk and, and so on? So it comes to um, 19, 1839. The East India Company has been quite rapacious. It's been growing um, opium in Bengal, which is also stolen. So it's a whole, it's a, it's a period of thievery, basically. Um, they, and, and, and the tea, the, the, the industrial espionage with tea is a, a thing that I can, I can come on to later. But with the opium, before the East India Company came along, the only opium that was consumed in China was the very expensive stuff that was produced in the Dutch East Indies, which is now oh. Indonesia. And um, because it was so expensive, it was just an aristocratic vice. You had to be very rich in order in order to consume it. So the East India Company, um, well, Britain was having they, they were having this trade deficit, this problem that the, the whole treasury is being emptied of gold bullion because the other thing is the Chinese didn't want gold; they wanted silver. So you had middlemen who were who were having to. Um, by the silver, so you're getting this markup as as well. Um, Britain was desperate for something to trade, so it didn't have to keep using its bullion. So they they very cleverly um, decide to to grow this cheap opium, which undercuts the Dutch price, and they create a market. This is the thing you you've got various um, revisionists. The various British academics who are saying, oh, but the merchants, they were only um, supplying a, a need, you know, well, what created that market? Because it wasn't there before. Mm. So they grow this very, very cheap opium using industrial, um, industrial revolution methods. They mass produce it. They take it to, to China where, yes, there, there are unscrupulous merchants, Chinese merchants who, who are, who are, uh, uh, buying it. Then Lin Zhu, Commissioner Lin Zhu, comes along and says, no, you can't sell this here. We, do, we don't want this opium. And um, Lord Palmerston and others in Britain, you see, there's a whole, this is the difference. There's a huge debate that goes on in Britain, in Parliament, because you've got people like Gladstone, you've you've got thinkers like Cobden who are opposed to this, who actually see how morally this is just completely wrong, um, to, that the East India Company should be, be making a fortune from selling narcotics. Lord Palmerston says no free trade, free trade, free trade. They 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 send the army in, they 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 send their navy and, and the military to China, and they force China to take this at the point of a gun. There are massacres, they are they are killing Chinese in order to in, impose this 
this opium onto China. Uh, one of the things that people have always got wrong, which I've been yelling since uh, 2010, actually, and, you know, and people still get it wrong. Lin says you didn't burn the opium for Correct. obvious for obvious reasons. But nobody, I mean, it's incredible. There are these books, there's Julia Lovell's book from 2012 that was saying it. And I keep saying they didn't burn it. They destroyed it with uh, seawater and, and lime. And, lime. and I, would, I was, you know, I'm glad that people now are understanding that this, this is the situation. But I did feel like a lone voice for ages saying, no, no, this is, you, you're, you're getting this wrong. I was, and I was, I was very disappointed to, to learn that people... Um, we're, we're thinking, you know, pro pro China um, people as well thought thought that the war was fought in order to stop China producing opium. It's like it's not taught in schools. When I did this show called the Steampunk Opium Wars at the uh, Royal M uh, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, which was like doing it in the very heart of empire, in the belly of the beast. It was quite funny. I was quite amused just the fact that we did it there, there at all. Um, nobody in the audience or very few people knew about the Opium Wars. And the only people I know who knew about the Opium Wars were those who'd gone through private schooling. So it was interesting that the state schools weren't teaching it, but the private schools were, 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 were teaching it. So what you have now is a similar situation. China's running ahead again or, or basically catching up to where it should be, like a big beach ball being held underwater. This thing wants to wants to rise. You know, it's huge. They have had civilization for so long. They they you know that they haven't had a war in 40 years. And here is the West yet again trying to get this raiding party on China carving up Xinjiang, trying to get Tibet the way that they always have. And you look at their map of how, what they think China should look like, and it's just this sort of small, um, shriveled uh, gnome of an east, east coast. So anything, what, what else did you want to know about it? Sorry? Yeah, it's just a very uh, similarity is how, you know, they were forced to, to kind of buy opium at the time, but now they're looking, they're, now they're forcing the sale of, TikTok. They're saying, oh, you can't trade with us unless you sell us TikTok. And they're pretty much doing the same thing. You know, all these sanctions are placing on technology companies and Huawei and stuff. And it, it does look like this all this uh, technology war that they're having, it could probably lead to a real one by the, by the, by the looks of it. And um, uh, I mean, all, all the kind of all the, all, the, all the stuff that some of these uh, Republicans and Democrats are saying and and the, all the trouble they're causing in Taiwan and Philippines. And now you have the Japanese um, prime minister who went to the United States recently, and he's also calling for uh, China as an enemy. And he, 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 he's going to join ACUS as well, um, which is... Um, a, a joint um, military um, submarine deal between UK, Australia, United States, and now Japan's going to come into it. So it seems, it seems like they're, you know, they're saying one thing and doing another. Uh, I, I just, um, yeah, it's very, very similar, similar the way kind of the opium war started. Really, they they, were forcing... they, they would like to see. They they can't. They have no imagination to be able to create a different world. So what they're doing is they're falling back on an old template, which of course is after the um, the, the first opium war, uh, which was eighteen thirty nine for a few years. They then have this very unfair treaty where they steal Hong Kong. You have these enclaves of the Western traders from America as well. America made money from the opium wars. You know, so, so I mean, this opium, which is grown in Bengal, the, the audacity that grown in a sto stolen, st stolen land in India and then taken to um, inflicted on, on China. They're trying to do the, the same thing today and and the japan thing is shameful and remember japan didn't just have unit 731 and kill loads and loads of chinese the cruelty to the british PO, pow's and you know the the allies is not absolutely notorious there are f films made about it and suddenly again we see how this reversal how this this culture 
cultural manipulation works, where you, in people's heads now, Japan is is some sort of savior, and it's a is the good guy. You know, they're pumping out radioactive waste into the it into into the sea, um, but all the time it's this absolute relentless pumping of um, of, of propaganda. That it's very disappointing to see people swallowing. Of course, not the lovely audience who are tuning in today. Thank you, everyone who's turned up to, um, to, to listen to us. So I'm hoping there is a steady trend to, towards people understanding what's really going on underneath underneath the bonnet or underneath the hood, as Americans would say. Yeah, we've got about 430 people joined so far. So let's get, get let's get this number to 500, guys. Make sure you like, share, and also comment. It helps the algorithm as well when you kind of speak with each other and stuff. It does help. Uh, but I wanted to bring in Jerry, really. I mean, um, you're 100% right what you said, Anna. Uh, and... Um, what I wanted to kind of uh, say, say is basically... During that time when the when they were growing it in Bengal, I mean India has has very good agriculture and it still has very good agriculture. And when they were growing all this opium in India, they were causing massive famines because they were taking the agriculture food for themselves, but also using um, their lands to grow opium where they can trade with China. And millions of Indians died for, I mean, they had huge famines in India when, when all this was going on. And I remember when Churchill said, it's not my fault um, these Indians are breeding or something along those lines. Oh, horrible, horrible. yeah. Yeah, something, something along those lines. But, but yeah, I wanted to kind of bring in Jerry, really. I mean, do you, see any, do you see any similarities between what's happening and do you see anything escalating over the next few few months? And do you think as things will escalate even more when Trump comes into power? No, I, I'm, I'm not of the same mind. I see similarities for sure, absolutely similarities for sure. And I see uh, what the West would like to see as a similar situation to when they controlled China. And they did control China. Um, Anna talked about the Opium Wars, and she said there were these enclaves. There were actually 46 treaty ports or um, designated areas that did not belong to China inside of China. And many people think that the Japanese invaded um, China in 1937. They didn't. They were fighting Russia in the 1890s in China in a place called, uh, what they believe it or not, Port Arthur. Nice English name for a Chinese <laughs> a Chinese city. Uh, Port Arthur is port is part of um, Dalian. Now, in, in 1904, 1905, there was a Japanese-Russian war which took place in China, and this war killed thousands, tens of thousands of Chinese, as well as 56,000 Japanese troops died taking Dalian from the Russians, and then it was carved up. The Japanese were allowed to take part of that area, and then all of the Korean Peninsula, and the Russians were given areas to the to the west of that where Vladivostok is and, and these kinds of things. So there's a lot going on. I mean, there's much more detail than what I've just given you there, but that's effectively, that was going on in the 1890s. And at the same time, Germany had Shandong uh, or parts of Shandong. France had parts. Italy had parts. Britain had parts. The Americans had parts. Everybody had their little slice of China. We, you know, we take a look at Shanghai now, and it was it was div it was divided into different sections. Here's the British sector. Here's the international sector. Here's the French sector. This is why we have different uh, architecture in Shanghai. Same thing in Guangzhou, Wuhan, Chongqing. Name a city in China that you've heard of. Alternative or other countries had their presence there. And local laws applied. So, yeah, there's a huge problem in the history. Uh, so Hong Kong was taken away. Macau was slightly different. It was never taken away. It was leased to the Portuguese on a friendly basis. Um, Taiwan has now been taken away, technically. And, and so you can see why China says, no, we're not going to go through this again. So in terms of similarities, I can see what the West wants, but I can't see the West achieving it. That's a one thing that China's military has made it very clear. It will defend China. 
And honestly, that's all they've ever said. They've never said they're going to attack or take Taiwan. They've said they will defend Taiwan from being taken away. So that's the difference between what it was in the past and what it is now. So uh, curving escalator in Shanghai. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned Shanghai. I, I, just I just really wanted to show you guys this because I saw this uh, yesterday and I was absolutely amazed. I mean, check this out. Um, Check this curving escalator. Have you ever seen anything like it in your life? I mean, I've never seen a curving escalator. This is the first time I've seen this. And I was absolutely amazed by this. And this is a brand new um, shopping center built in Shanghai, um, just overlooking the river, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I think got completed this year or something. But curving escalators. I mean, wow, look at this, guys. I mean, wow. Uh -huh. you can, can this is another place. German company, I think. I think you'll find this is a, a, a Tyson group. And look, there's there's an advert for Kiehl's, which I think is a German brand as well. But I think you'll find this is Tyson group. They actually designed the very first ever accelerating escalator. So you get on it and it accelerates. Now, I'm not talking about the one that has the power saving where it slows down. I'm talking about an escalator or a travelator that actually accelerates. Now, there's well, no other company have done that, and it was done in China, but it was done by a German company. So there you go. You've got German manufacturing. Tyson Group are huge here. They're, they're actually very big here in Zhongshan, where I live. So, yeah, they've got those sorts of things, and, and they're designed, they're built, they're engineered here, but they're engineered with Chinese and German technicians working together. Here we go. So um, one of our... Um one of our viewers basically asked a question earlier and he said what's your thoughts about the space race and i thought i'd add um this little story to it um turkey uh, and recently even thailand and i think thailand joined yesterday or the day before i saw a news article uh, but there's 10 countries which have joined um the international space station um Oh, sorry. When I say space station, I mean a base on the moon that they're, they're building with Russia. Mm -hmm. So 10 countries have joined so far. And um, I mean, a little bit of history. I, I'm sure most people know that China was actually banned from the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. And um, and recently, I think I read yesterday that um, American NASA scientists were asking for moon samples from China. And uh, mm. people in the comment section went wild. They were like, hang on a second, America landed on the moon how many times? They didn't let China any like grams of moon dust or anything like that. They, they banned them from the International Space Station and every other space um, um, program. But now they're basically asking for moon rocks from, from China. I mean, what's, what's your thoughts? What's, what's going on here? I mean, do, should China give it to them? Because... Sounds a bit, bit cheeky to me. Well, it, it, we're probably not going to hear about it in the mainstream if China gives it to them. You, you know, there is, I think there are sort of um, back channels where scientists are talking to each other, thank, thank goodness. But, um, you know, there's this complete blackout in, in the news here, if anything positive that comes from China, obviously, and it is ironic that they're having to ask for, for for moon rocks when once upon a time that just would have been the norm. You know, you just you just exchange this stuff, this this knowledge. So you have this Western entity that is still waging its war and this awful character assassination of China on one level, while they they know that they need stuff from China. You know, I'm looking forward today, I'm wondering if we're ever going to see a time when this charade is dropped and that we can, we can just go ahead with getting on as a human race. America, you know, the Chinese really liked America because America was... was um, more positive you know despite the korean war, war um they got a lot more out of uh, america since uh, nixon than they, they ever have from britain so uh, i'm i'm looking forward to a time when everyone can get back on track and i'm hoping we look at this period as just some sort of aberration but there's also the sort of the awareness that well this is how imperialism works you know, so which is going to win out? Is it going to be socialism or barbarism, as Rosa Luxemburg once asked? 
let's ask the audience, guys. Do you think China should give um, US NASA scientists moon rocks? Uh, make sure you put your comments on the I, comments. I had a theory on this one. I mean, the, the, the moon rocks are one thing. Uh, America, I believe America did go to the moon. I'm, I'm, whether or not the moon landing was faked is neither here nor there. America has been to the moon and has come back. Whether the videos are real or not, it doesn't matter. But I, that's my belief anyway. But the thing is, China has now gone. What China has done is it has uh, scientifically analyzed and it has written reports and the reports are public. They, they, they haven't hidden the information that they have. And, and one of the things that I'm very pleased to see what China has done, it, it, it took, it analyzed the, the rocks that it brought back and it has built a 3D printer, which it's going to send to the moon. So that 3D printer coupled with automation can actually build a habitation before people go there. I believe that China will be in the team that wins the space race if there needs to be a space race. What's wrong with cooperation? Um, Kevin is, is saying they should not give the lunar samples. I say maybe they could as a sign of goodwill and good gesture, but I would suggest asking for a very, very large in the billions of dollars deposit because <laughs> they are very, very prone. NASA are very prone to losing things. We know this for a fact. They keep saying, oh, we can't find that information. We can't find the, the videos of, of the moon. We can't find photographs that came back from the moon. We can't find this, we can't find that. So NASA are very good at losing things. So I think, I don't know what it costs to go to the moon and pick them up, but China needs to say, well, look, it cost us $3 billion to go and get them. So you're going to put a $2 billion deposit in case we have to go and get more, something like that. That would be my view. The moon has got lots of treasures. For example, helium-3, you need that for a fusion reaction uh, or a fusion reactor. And um, also it's got plenty of hydrogen. Uh, at the moment, hydrogen and helium-3 on Earth are very, very expensive and very hard to make, especially helium-3. I think there's very, very minute uh, quantities of it. But yeah, there's, there's a treasure trove of goods in, in the moon. and. and uh, I think if China and Russia manage to build up a, a moon base, um, the amount of um, technologically advanced uh, as human beings we, we could become, you know, we could, we're basically all these new technologies and new um, new kind of um, stuff will come out of it, like a more a better, better transport uh, to fly around, for example, and more robots, AI, uh, lots of great technologies that can come out of it. Because w when America landed on the moon, I mean, um, whether it was fake or not, doesn't matter, but it did advance our space. Um, and also it has advanced technology as well, because you can argue that um, a lot of the technology we have today, like mobile phones and telecommunications and 4G, 5G, all started from you know the moon landing, from the technology we, we got from there. And um, so, yeah, you could, we could, uh, uh, and they're also saying that, you know, space is a treasure trove for basically um, minerals and, and raw, raw, raw materials that we need, um, for example, rare earths and copper, gold and stuff. So rather than mining the earth and destroying earth in the process, you can actually mine an asteroid and get everything you need. So that could be mm -hmm. like um, the future, really. Um, but yeah, I've I've also read reports that United States is actually falling behind. Um, their moon landing program is called Artemis, and they're already falling behind. Uh, there's also budget problems as well, and and recently a, a rocket failed as well. Uh, one of the yeah. Artemis rockets failed recently. Well, so they're, they're several already... years behind schedule, and and they've got another problem as well in that they plan to send the first. Uh, non-white person to the moon. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. Send send the best person you've got. It doesn't matter what gender, what color. It doesn't matter. Send the best person you've got. But they're they're really concerned that they must show that they're um, showing this equality. It, it it beggars belief that this is more important than the science. Can I say there's one advantage to sending women to the moon, and that is, of course, that um, you get bigger brain for your buck because they're smaller. So the weight is going to be 
lighter. So I say, yay, <laughs> send them whatever <laughs> color, send women to the moon. That's true. There is a Chinese um, astronaut, female astronaut. Oh, she was amazing. The teacher, yeah. the one who was teaching up there. Yeah, I loved her. I was, I, I watched her, her stuff. She's lovely. They, yeah. they call it Tokenot, right? Toikonot, or is it? Um, Tokenot. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote a show called Ta Taikonaut about um, 15 years ago. It's set, set on, on uh, the Shenzhou. Um, so, yeah, I may have to get that and dust that off yeah. at some point and see if we can get you out should. of that. You should, Anna. <laughs> but I would love to see, you know, what a shame that humanity as a whole can't can't join up and and do this stuff. So just imagine if it was China... Russia and America, and I think, you know, Japan and India, obviously, have, you know, um, the, champing at the bit to, to get up there as well. And all of these contrived conflicts are just get, getting in the way of, um, of, of taking humanity forward, whether it's climate change, whether it's um, space exploration. We've got absolute clowns in charge. And I don't know what they're playing. I think these they, they, they just seem to be very limited, inadequate people who who unfortunately are in the driving seat at the moment. Mm. Exactly, exactly. Um, so let's move on to the next topic, actually. Um, so I saw this article saying that Huawei is actually looking to build uh, a chip making equipment. Uh, research and development center in Shanghai and I was reading a bit more about this and it seems like um, the equipment that China is banned from buying from you know ASML and other countries like in Japan and Korea um, who are always looking to build its own and I've also read a bit more about it apparently what they're looking to do uh, instead of building the machine like you have in ASML they are looking to build some sort of particle accelerator um, under underground, and which will kind of give you the super fast laser that you need to build semiconductors, and um, and they will use that to basically use that as a factory to kind of churn out hundreds and thousands of chips per day. Um, so it seems like they're very um, seems like this this could be a reality happening of the next kind of five years or, or so, but, but Huawei is an example of these sanctions which have not worked. You know, I, I mean, I can give you another example, which is Russia. I mean, th these Western countries and companies and leaders who think that, you know, they're so arrogant that they can sanction a country or a company and think, oh, we're going to destroy that, you know, we're going to destroy that company by sanctioning it. It's completely failed. It's actually backfired because Huawei's come back. It's now building its own chips. It's going to build its own chip equipment. It's building its own EV cars. It's it's, div it's diverted its um, business to other areas uh, and also um, many kind of I IT stuff. It's got its own operating system, the um, what you know, the Harmony OS. So it's actually made Huawei stronger, the same way the sanctions have made Russia stronger. And they are forgetting that you know they're so arrogant. They are forgetting that. China's got a um, population of 1.4, you know, billion people. So if you're going to sanction a Chinese company, and what do you think they're going to do? They're going to obviously sell to their own, you know, own people. And uh, and 1.4, it's, it's, it's just going to make the, the people buy that product even more, right? Because of nationalism. nationalism, nationalism. And plus... Um, you know, the the whole country would be behind Huawei helping it, you know, become better and and try and, you know, help with the research and development. And this is what China's been doing. They've, they've been actually, you know, helping Huawei kind of get over these sanctions as well. Uh, and it's become a national pride for the Chinese um, getting over this semiconductor hurdle. And I think they're very close. I think whether it's this year or the next year, I think they're going to come up with some remarkable technological process uh, and I uh, find a way to make five nanometer chips I mean they, they are making five nanometer chips at the moment but it's it's called it's called stacking technology which is not not using the EUV machines to do it but pro problem doing it that way is um it, 
it uses uh, it generates more heat because you're stacking more than one chip together and also um it causes other problems as well. Still, the chip is bigger than a, a normal five nanometer as well because you're stacking uh, different chips on top of each other. So it's not a true, you know, five nanometers like the ones TSMC make. But yeah, I, but they are heading along the the right directions. And it's just another example of you know these sanctions failing and, and these Western leaders who who are so arrogant who think they know it all and they think they can just sanction companies and countries and. Uh, and they will bow to their feet. And I mean, what, what's your thoughts, guys? I think it shows how, you know, American capitalism has um, has definitely stopped working, you know, because if you are producing everything purely for profit and that profit is going to a tiny elite, that affects everything. So instead of humanity being able to use its resources wisely, for things that we need, um, that, that's being stopped. That process is being stopped. And that can't be good for humanity. We're just being held up all the time. I'd agree with that. Um, every time, every time America sanctions China, China finds a way around it. It's <laughs> as simple as that. Um, now, <clears throat> that's not to say that this didn't hurt when, when when China sanctioned Huawei, that hurt. It hurt Huawei, no doubt about that at all. But they've bounced back, as you say. They've got a whole new range of products. A friend of mine, we talked about this, uh, Lee Barrett, the other day we talked about, he's just bought the Aito, which is the, uh, the, the Huawei operating system car. He's uh, very, very happy with that. It's a great car. Um, the, you know, when, when they start doing things like this and, and opening up this chip center, it's, it may be a couple of years of a hiccup, and that's all it is for, for China. They have far, far more graduate engineers coming out of PhD courses and master's courses at Tsinghua University in terms of automation, robotics, uh, IT, and science and technology is way, way higher than now MIT is. And if you take a look at MIT, you'll see that half of the classes there are Chinese. So you've got Chinese, Indians, some Pakistanis, even some Iranians working in MIT. It's an international class, but when they finish to graduate, where are they going to work? At the moment, Chinese people are not getting good jobs in America, so they're going to come back here. Those who are here now are staying here because this is where it is. Now, I'll put out an appeal here now, and if anybody knows anybody who has a PhD and would like to work in China, I can assure you there are people in China who will snap you up. They will take PhDs from anywhere, any discipline, and they will give them jobs, great salaries, great packages, fast track to uh, permanent residency. They're doing all kinds of things just to bring in the talent that they need. and. The talent's coming from everywhere, including America, because a lot of Americans working in the chip industry suddenly found themselves out of a job. Where are they going to go to work? Because there's there's no alternative right now. So some of them are looking for place for jobs. In you know, Huawei has a massive number of foreign engineers, foreign technicians working there. And I don't know, I really don't know how many R&D people they've got, but it is in the tens of thousands. It's not small. Exactly. I've read a report that China is opening a brand new university every single week. So a new university is just popping up every single week. And like you said, there's 10 times more STEM graduates, which is a science, technology, engineering, um, you know, the, the technology, yeah, mathematics, um, uh, the technology based graduates, there's 10 times as much coming out of China as opposed to United States, and, and yep. with the with the economy going badly in the West at the moment, with high inflation, cost of living, you know, China has become a very very attractive place to work, and I'm I'm sure you'll see a lot of um, you know talented people going to China to work and and working on these high end fields, and you wouldn't surprise me. And and people, you know, you, you see in the West, they're, they're always talking about demographic problems. Oh, oh the China's going, China's having demographic demographic issues. Are they going to lose their population? But but they don't understand that if China becomes the number one economy and their 
economy is doing better than the West, they're going to have huge amounts of, you know, immigrants like America did, you know, in the 1700s, 1800s. You know, there's huge amounts of people went to America to kind of live the American dream, as they would say. So if China becomes the number one economy, they don't they don't have to worry about, you know, demographics because you're going to have the world's best people moving to China to to live and work there on, on some of the best technologies, best, you know, living conditions. This is the natural gra gravity that I think you are going to, to get the best brains going to um, to China. Our universities here are just going down the pan. There was a long article in The Guardian about the, certainly the humanities and the troubles that they're having at Goldsmiths um, university, university. So that you can see why the American elite is so panicked and so angry and furious and hysterical because they're seeing they're losing everything. But instead of understanding that America's implosion is leaving this vacuum, they're saying, oh, China's doing it to us. They're taking it away. If it wasn't for China, what? You'd, you'd, you'd be in the same place as China? This is absolutely absurd. So instead of America being smart and doing what Britain was doing during the the, um, the David Cameron golden, golden era and hitching a ride on China's success, they're trying to stop it. I, I mean, this is such a... There are, they are a bunch of canutes. Uh, remember, remember that uh, King Canute. Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, that's a spelling mistake, isn't it? The, yeah, it's, they, the, yeah. We in English we call him Canute, but he's C N U T Canute. Yes. And he did that on Canvey Island, which you'd see probably you know quite well. See you next Tuesday. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. go and and, and Doctor Feelgood. But he sat. I didn't know. I didn't know he did it in in on Canary Island. That makes it even yeah. more interesting. But he. So the purpose was he wasn't being an idiot and saying oh, I can stop the waves. He was trying to show the idiots around him how pathetic it was to think that even a king could stand in front of these waves and stop the tide g going over him. And this is very much what we're 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 seeing America doing and this new brand of UK non-elected government. Mm. The the problem I see it is misinformation. The uh, the American and the Anglo world, which which is pretty much American influenced media anyway, is misinformed to the point. I, I get told all the time that I live in in a, a dictatorship. I don't. I live in a robust democracy, much more robust democracy than the UK is and Australia. And I've lived in both of those, so I know this for a fact. I live in a robust democracy. I get told I live in an authoritarian state, but I have far more freedoms here than I ever had in Australia or the UK, so I don't live in an authoritarian state. I get told that I live in a police state, but you know it's been five years or six years since the police in China, the whole of China, not my city, the whole of China, the police haven't shot anybody in six years. Now, that's not to say the police don't carry guns. A lot of them do but they haven't shot anyone. They haven't had a need to. Now, in America, someone gets shot every seven hours by the police on average. It's a thousand a year. It's about yeah, a thousand. That's, and, and that's three a day. Every seven hours, three point something a day, police are shooting somebody every seven hours in the United States. And in China, they haven't shot anyone. The incarceration number of people incarcerated in China is lower than the number of people incarcerated in America which has one quarter or less than one quarter of the population of China. So this is not a police state. It's not an authoritarian state. It's certainly not a backward state. All of this misinformation is leading people to believe that their country, wherever they happen to be, is better. I can't believe that the mentality of Australian people who say, you know, China had to kowtow to, to us because, you know, we control their coal and their iron ore. No, you don't. China's entire imports from Australia amount to 2% of China's imports. That's it. Australia's entire exports to China amount to 40%, or almost 40%. So there's a very strong difference. You know, they're saying, well, China is taking loads of iron ore from us because they need it. And China's saying, well, we'll take it from Australia, but we'll get it from West Africa. We'll get it from Brazil as well. The percentages are minuscule. Australia could be swatted like a gnat by China, and yet they strongly believe 
that China is some kind of a poor backward country that they can help and only they can help. It, it, it beggars belief. So th this complete misunderstanding of what China is, China is right now the richest country. It's the easiest country in which to live. It's probably the safest country in the world. It has a much lower suicide rate than places like Australia, New Zealand, America. It's very similar, actually. UK has a very low suicide rate. I'm not sure why that is, but China's is slightly lower than the UK's. Uh, they're both in the six, uh, six per 100,000 people, but China's is lower than the UK. When you start looking at these statistics and you say, well, hang on a second, that's not the China that I'm reading about, then you start to realize that something in your media is wrong. But it takes some kind of a mental adjustment to say everything, everything that I'm reading is wrong, everything. And once you suddenly realize that, it's going to be a huge disappointment to your life because you cannot trust anything in any media because you know they've lied to you about this, something you do know about. And that's what's happened to me with the UK and BBC, things like that. I just simply cannot trust them at all on anything because I know without a shadow of a doubt everything they tell me is a lie. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I've been um, very disappointed by the, by the British media. Hmm. Um. No, it's a shame because I was supposed to be, be uh, participating in a discussion about Anime Wong on Front Row the other the other night, and um, yeah. I, got, I got disinvited, <laughs> which was a shame. But I have written my review. What, what happened, uh, Anna? Why, why did they did they give you a reason? Or? Um, no, I mean I was asking if I could do it online instead of having to go into the studio, and then the, they. I sent them the articles that I've written about um, Anime Wong and various other things. And I was just told by the producer, there has been some discussion, some toing and froing about this. Um, we're going to instead use a, an, an academic from, um, who, who was an American. I thought, oh, all right, fair, fair enough. You know, young woman sta standing in. But I think when you listen to it, you can make up your own minds, you know, and read the review, the, the points that I probably would have made had I been participating. And that's all at anachen.co.uk. Sorry, I can't write this in the in the sidebar because it won't take uh, links for some reason. So I was really proud. The first time I ever had my programmes on the BBC and, you know, wrote for The Guardian. You know, th these were prestigious outlets. It was it was a great pride that, that I was making stuff for, for them. And I was allowed, this is during the golden era, of course, I was allowed to make programs about China. And I wanted to humanize Chinese because I thought it was really dangerous that there was um, a complete vacuum of Chinese representation in the culture. Um, apart from the usual stereotypes, we know, you know, going back to, to Yellow Peril. So mm -hmm. there was a glorious period where I was I was allowed to make these these programs. Go for I mean, I was I was doing stuff about anime Wong. I was doing doing stuff about the Chinese in Britain. Um, I even did a program about the uh, um, the chopsticks. You know that da 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 da. da you, you know the the, the musical yeah. groups that 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 create yeah. its subhuman images about. Chinese so I was allowed to explore all this stuff and then basically the I think the last time I got to write anything for the Guardian was um it was about Chung Sam's the Chi Pao um that was oh I don't know 10 years ago or, or something I did put a warning in there about what was coming down the pike at everyone so maybe that um you, you know that that might have put them off a little but, bit so, too much honesty, Anna. I, I, well, I think it, it wasn't just honesty. It's like you're giving an alternative view. And you're widening the bandwidth of how people can think about the world, how they, how can, they can think about China. And, yes, America leads in propaganda because this sort of goes back to the advertising. If you think, you know, America is, is all about selling stuff. And creating fear and anxiety, and then the companies come in and say, "But we can, you know, we have the solution to, to your fear and your anxiety." Um, and they've uh, they've used this now with the military. We know there there have been various books um, written about this, including the classic "The Hidden Persuaders" that I remember d um, d talking to, to Jerry about uh, a few years back. So um, America has this 
they've made it a science and an art. How do you manipulate an entire population and get them thinking along certain lines? And we know the CIA is in, you, you know, used used this. There are whole armies of psychologists now. Psychology isn't there just to make you feel better and to cure you. It is about mass manipulation. Mm. I, I had a similar experience, Anna, about um, two years ago. One of my friends here in Australia, who's a regular listener to the ABC, sent them a copy of an article that I'd written about China. And they, re they, they came back to me. This is, you know, I didn't know anything about this. I just got an email from the ABC. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. I didn't know anyone in the ABC, but you know, I got an email from them saying, you know, we've read your article and we're very interested in this and we'd like to interview you. Would you be interested in coming on a live radio show on Thursday evening at 10 o'clock or something like that? And I said, sure, I, I'm really interested in that. This is such a surprise. Thank you. And then an hour later, I got another message which said, um, uh, thank you very much for your interest, but we've decided not to proceed. <laughs> <laughs> So I think somebody they said to an intern somewhere, "Have a look at this guy and just just get some get some talking points from him." And they looked at my my record yeah. and said, "No, we don't want this." Uh, Anna, if you if you're interested in making your Anna Wong story into a film or maybe some sort of um, drama, I can get you in touch with um, some contacts who might be interested in in doing a film or something because it's a very interesting. Um, take really, I think it, it definitely needs to be shown to the outside world. Oh, you know, thank you. I, I mean, um, I actually had a show called Anime Wong Must Die, which again, you know, when I get my kit, when I upgrade my kit, I'm going to start start doing doing stuff to camera. I I actually wanted to turn that into a um, a, a graphic novel. As, yeah, as well. yeah, so about it. Yeah, because I actually studied film and I actually made quite a few short films and I also directed um, behind the scenes a few episodes of Hollyoaks and um, really? I did, uh, yeah, oh I did Hollyoaks God. and I did like Casualty and I did um, yeah I did quite a lot of uh, BBC uh, shows uh, back that was a long time ago that was more than ten oh, years ago way, way before my uh, you know YouTube channel but. Um, but yeah, I've still got like lots of contacts in the field. So if you if you're interested, we can um, I can get you in touch with loads of people. Uh, okay, I, I can't put the links here here, but I'll put. Um, there is an anime one must must die. Um, yeah. clip. I, I, I can show you some of my stuff as well. I've made loads of short films back in the day. Yeah, uh, they've, no, they've, I, yeah they've won awards as well. Yeah. They've won in festivals and things. So I was I was quite good, but. But then um, the, the issue is, um, yeah, the issue is, uh, um, well, basically what happened was I, I got married, so I didn't have the time to make films anymore. Because back then I was single, I was a young lad, you know, I could uh, pretty much go filming and editing. It used to take up all my time. But then I got married and I had to kind of settle down. And, um, yeah, so I kind of left it and just got like a cushy nine-to-five government job. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a whole new dimension about you that obviously <laughs> we knew nothing about. I'm, I'm, I really like it when people have creative things that they're doing. It's like you know Jerry doing those amazing bike trips around around China, yeah. and now we hear about you doing this. I'm going to put a link in my Twitter, which is Anna Chen Miao, because I can't put links in in, in the sidebar here. But it, there's a, there is a clip what I was doing I'd love to develop it in, into, into into something longer because what we're getting is a, a lot of we're getting the official version of anime Wong stripped of the the political um, landscape and climate that created this creature and what was imposed on her to present her as representing from China I mean I think she was amazing because she grew um, a political consciousness later on you know how can you not if, if you're seeing all these contradictions, the way you're being treated um, as, as something different and subhuman, and then seeing what happened with the Japanese in China. She grew as a person, and I, that's what I would like to see. But instead, the emphasis is on just the identity politics. That's an important strand, but it's not everything about her. And for us to learn about our, ourselves and how the Chinese 
developed and how we are seen in the West. She's a, such an important figure. So I'm going to put this in my um, in my Twitter anyway. Yeah, well, I think next time we can talk about it. And also, I was going to talk to you about the Three Body uh, Program in Netflix as well. But I oh. Reckon... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to. I'm about to write my long review. Yeah, on that yeah we as can well. talk that for next time. But, okay. but let's move on, actually, because um, I saw this article today. This is a fresh article came out uh, just this morning, and it says U.S. lawmakers angry about Huawei unveiling a new laptop with a new AI chip, or with a new Intel AI chip. So basically, basically, what's happened is um. Intel was not allowed to sell AI chips to Huawei, and suddenly they ended up in Huawei laptops. <laughs> and um, and I, I don't know if you heard some of the news. I mean, I, I, I'm quite like up to date with technology. Yesterday, um, yesterday there was a news that that actually Intel share price fell by around twelve percent yesterday because. Um, the Chinese said, told all the telecommunication companies not to use Intel chips in their machines. And because of that, uh, AMD and Intel, um, their shares went down by 12%. So apparently um, Intel is not allowed to sell AI chips, but you can, you can see why. You know? I mean, um, you, if you're a, if you're a like, company and you, you have a, an American chip on a laptop, and tomorrow, suddenly, this um, this the company says, "Oh, we can't sell you the chip anymore." I mean, you as a company, you 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 can go bankrupt overnight because you know you've set, your whole supply chain you know, basically depends on this on this chip, and it's very hard to find another chip and you know and stuff like that. So, so that I, I can understand the government telling companies to move away from Intel and AMD chips, but I think this is. Um, as as China becomes more and more developed, the more te they become technologically aware of semiconductors, and, and and as they develop new chips and AI chips, I think they're going to slowly move away from the West because it's just too risky. What's your thoughts, Jeremy? To be honest, I don't know very much about the AI chips. I know that the AI chips are at that higher level that are not allowed to be sold. But I do also know that China bought a lot of chips before they i think they have a stockpile of chips and that's <laughs> one of the issues they they're buying stuff or they were buying stuff before because if, if you think about what washington is washington is a leaky sieve they they start to you know they they're, they're always big noting themselves and they're, they're in the media saying we're going to put this sanction on we're going to put this restriction on we're going to we're going to stop this from happening before they have the authority to do it because they want to big note themselves and, and this is what I think may have happened with this particular Intel chip. I'm just looking at my Lenovo computer, and I have an Intel Core i5, which is a lower-level chip, and I have an Intel Iris X6, I think it is, graphic chip. Now, so there's two Intel chips in the laptop that I'm talking to you on. So, you know, there's plenty of, and this is a relatively new laptop, so there's plenty of Intel chips, but the, the level of them is what would make lawmakers angry. Reuters is a little bit more reliable than the BBC. If this was in the BBC, I'd say, yeah, let's check on it. There might be an experimental, uh, they'd be reporting an experimental laptop rather than a, a commercially available laptop. Uh, so I'm really not sure what's going on with this particular one. It only happened today and I haven't seen it, so I don't know. And these new laptops also have um, Huawei's own operating system, so they're, they're not using Windows. They're not using Apple's iOS. No, no that's, that's not strictly true. I, I'm still using a Windows system. Um, the, the China. This is a no. Lenovo built in China, and it's it's less than a year old. No, I'm talking uh, about and, the brand new one, the the one okay. that the the Huawei new ones right. that's been unveiled. So a brand new laptop right. has been unveiled today. Like, um, so this was basically. Do you remember the time when R Renando? Um, yeah. Came to, came to China and uh, they Huawei. The Mate 60. Yeah, they, they launched the Mate sixty. So it sounds to me they're doing the same thing when um, just when Janet Yellen Yellen has left, and uh, it's very also, similar. It, it's at the same time because I've been fretting for the last few days in the news that Apple is going to be releasing the M four chip because they've dropped it Intel, and I was I was thinking about getting the M three. Um, 
uh, iMac, only to see that there's this AI chip, the M4, that um, Apple's going to be coming out with. So, wow. So, so this is quite interesting to, to me that uh, there's this rivalry. Which system is going to win out then? If um, Huawei, Huawei's got its own system and they're using Intel, which has been dropped by Apple, and Apple's got its M4. I don't know what to get. If there's anyone actually listening who can who can give me some advice on this, I'd be enormously grateful. Guys, if you can give Anna any advice, I'd really appreciate it. I don't know if you can see the message on the screen, Anna. Somebody's already read your uh, articles. Oh, to Tommy Picture. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, thank you so much. There are people who know about you, so which is good. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, everyone come to my website because it's... Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more people. Um, it is worth reading your website, Anna. There's a lot of interest. You you have a wonderful way with words. Yeah. <laughs> and for everyone that's listening, um, apologies for Anna not showing herself. It's my fault. She didn't know it was going to be a YouTube channel today. I'm still but, in my pajamas. <laughs> but then, <laughs> I pulled out of bed but, thinking, oh, that's great. I can just, I can chat. Yeah, but I think we're... we're People on YouTube would prefer to see the face so they can see your beautiful face to go with your voice, basically. Oh, thank you. Not half asleep, though. <laughs> we'll do this next time. Next, next week, Anna will, Anna will be on the uh, Jerry's Take on China show in the flesh. <laughs> so oh, something, yeah. something, something to look forward to. I'll wash my hair and do my nails for that. <laughs> so that's Me too. Me too. <laughs> Twenty. That's the twenty fifth. That's the twenty fifth of April. Yeah. So let's let's talk a bit about infrastructure um, that's happening around China. So um, so Vietnam is going to be having high speed rail, which is um, it's going to be the same um, track as China has. So these these high speed rails can go directly into China, which is great for the region and Vietnam itself because imports exports will increase and trade between the countries will increase plus cultural exchange with people tour, tourism and stuff like that and there's already a line going to Laos and they're also looking to build a line going through Thailand all the way to Cambodia and also into another one into Laos um, and also uh, linking Vietnam as well but also going via Malaysia into Singapore, but the only sticking point is Malaysia. They, they they seem to be one of those hot and cold countries. One day they say, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. Next day they cancel it and um, they're having to pay Singapore um, fees for cancelling. Then, then they want to bring bring it back on again, then, then they're not sure. So Malaysia seems to be the only stick in the mud, but I think the rest of the countries, they are basically linking their infrastructure to China. Uh, which is going to be great for every country. And, and if you look at the trade figures for Laos, for example, uh, their GDP has grown uh, quadrupled since the high-speed rail um, come, has come about. So there, as a country, that is a great example to show the, the, the benefits of the Belt and Road and you know linking your you know high-speed rail to China and how, how much that country has improved. I mean, the GDP is quadrupled almost overnight, and which is which is amazing. And I think other countries can see that and they want to kind of do the same. Um, and, you know, I look at China and there's, there's high-speed rail projects all over China happening almost on a daily basis. They are approving projects and finishing other projects. And, you know, I think we're talking about 50,000, 60,000 kilometers uh, of high-speed rail they're building uh, or should be ready by the next few years. It's unbelievable progress. I mean, 20 years ago, China had no high-speed rail, but now they're almost covering the whole of China with high-speed rail. Well, what's your thoughts, uh, Jerry? And I'll go to Anna afterwards. Okay, I've got, I've got two thoughts on this. When I first came to China, I, I kind of had a laugh with my students. This was 2004, and I was teaching in a, 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 an international school, and a bunch of kids in the class, great kids, uh, all adults now. Of course, because this is 19 years ago. So they were 17 years old then or 18 years old. And, and they were telling me that they're going to build a fast train line to Beijing. And I kind of laughed and said, oh, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, and, and sure enough, uh, that was 2004 and 2012 it opened. 
at the same day they told me that China is going to build a bridge to Hong Kong, and I thought this was hilarious. I brought in a map after lunch. I went, I had my lunch, came back with a map, and I showed them where Hong Kong and Zhongshan are and said, look, there's no one going to build a bridge across there. And then they did. So there's those stories, which which are true stories, that you know Ch China says they're going to do something. Then you can be pretty sure they're going to do it. Now, 10 years ago, my father father-in-law uh, made an announcement over the dinner table that China is going to build a railway line to Australia. And I laughed. I said, well, the, you can't do that. It's just not possible. However, he said, they're already talking about it and they're already planning it. Now, don't ask me how they're planning it or how my father-in-law knew about this. But take a look at what is happening now with, first of all, Laos. It's going to go down through Thailand. You're right that Malaysia is up and down, hot and cold on it. But the plan is to take it all the way through it's going to go through vietnam as well all the way through to singapore now it's not very difficult a leap to go from parts of malaysia into parts of indonesia and they've already got one in indonesia now then your island hopping if you take a look at a map from malaysia to indonesia is very very close through the malacca straits they're looking all the way down they're going all the way down past Jakarta, down the other side, and they could one day, if the world wants it, build a train line all the way from Poland, effectively, to Melbourne. And that's that's a possibility. They've already got train lines going to Poland from here, but they're not high speed. The high speed train at the moment in the West stops in uh, Xinjiang. But it does go all the way to Korgas, which is the Kazakhstan border. And that's a huge uh, gas. Uh, the, the, the old train line brings gas in and there's pipelines coming through. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of things happening in China that we don't know about. Um, they have built for Indonesia. They have built for Laos and they have built. They are going to build for Thailand as well. So, yeah, it's, it's huge. Just to kind of um, show that map you were talking about, so just the viewers can see that map. Um, so this is exactly what it will look like once it's finished. Um, Anna, what's your thoughts? Britain's Britain spent billions on high-speed rail. And, 130 billion so far. Uh, and, and do you know what? that They, they um, demolished a load of historic flats near Euston. For, for the terminus and they can't even get there so it's just a waste we're having no high high speed rail but i dream of being able to get on a train in london and go all the way i mean can you imagine it, it like the orient express going all the way to china then through china and then down through um through malaysia ending up at singapore and all by land i think i mean that would be my dream journey mm. i would absolutely love to do that that we know that part of this could, could be done because in 2017 was it you know before everything blew up all the relations blew up china's first um bricks train arrived at barking in east london and i remember looking at that and thinking i i would just like to you know i wish they would sell tickets because i would like to get on that and go all the way back mm. to back to china I have a friend who did that. Uh, he, I was, I was doing a training course in Beijing, and on the first day of the training course, of chatting to them, getting to know them, I was, the, I was the trainer. They were, I, they were my trainees, trainee teachers. And uh, one guy said he'd taken 10, 10 weeks to arrive in China. I said, well, how, you know, what happened? And he said, oh, I, I took the train. I, I caught the train to, um, uh, to France. And then from France, I went up to Poland, and from Poland, I came all the way across Russia and through Mongolia, and then into uh, into China. Uh, so he'd he'd been doing a little bit of a zigzag uh, around, but getting off and spending a few days here, spending a few days there, and then just getting back on the train again. Fantastic journey. The trains in in UK are so expensive. I mean, I live in Manchester, and every time I have to go to London, it costs about one hundred and eighty pounds one way. Right. And and it's, it's absolutely crazy. I did a Twitter space about um, three months ago. And on my Twitter space, I had the project manager of, um, of the high-speed rail for UK. 
And he was project managing um, the line from London all the way to Manchester. So unfortunately, he had, he had to be let go of his job because they cancelled um, the line from London to Manchester. But, but he, he, was, uh, he was saying how, how the costs basically quadrupled um, almost like overnight due to not only inflation, but also because um, the cost of kind of um, the, the land uh, as well, uh, they had to kind of pay over the odds. And, and like you said, they, they, there was a lots of archite of, you know, archaeologist um, uh, stuff that they had to they, they, they found and they, they, they had, you know, they had to kind of destroy and stuff like that. But he, he told me that it was never going to be feasible because um, even though that he was a project manager, he said he, he, this high-speed rail, even if they finish it, it would never be feasible because if you look at what the prices are now of, of trains um, from London to Manchester, it's, it costs £180. For, for, for the high-speed rail, for them to break even, and we're talking about, you know, if they want to make that 130, 150 billion pounds back, they, they need to charge people 500 pounds per ticket um, for them to be able to break even within 30 or 40 years. And that's going to be impossible because no one no one's going to pay 500 pounds a ticket. Um, you know, China actually offered to, to help us build our high speed rail. Yeah, yeah, they did, and and he said that um, UK said no because they wanted to keep all the manufacturing and jobs in UK and stuff like that. Uh, but they, they should have just gone with with the Chinese because um, you know the other other thing he said, uh, which is like um, absolutely shocking, is for them to go. You know, they cancelled the Manchester line, but they, they they're going to keep the line to go from London to Birmingham, and. He said that if you count the time it takes to go from London to Birmingham, it's only going to save you 10 minutes. So all that money they're wasting, 150 billion or so, just to save 10 minutes to go from London to Birmingham, it's just not worth it. And, and the reason, it, you know, and you can't even go from central London. He said you can't build a station in Euston anymore because um, it's not feasible anymore. So they're, they're building a brand new station just out, on the outskirts of London, yeah. so, so you're gonna have to go on the outskirts, which is gonna cost it's gonna cost you and take you like half an hour from central London, and then from there you have to go all the way to Birmingham. But by, by the time you you get to Birmingham, you'll find that you've only saved ten minutes, and plus you, you're gonna have to pay four times as much as the current trains from London to Birmingham are the, because. Um, they obviously have to, you know, claim back those costs. He says, he says, within ten years, um, that high-speed rail is going to go bankrupt. No one's going to pay for it because you might as well just stay on the existing train, even, even though it's slower. You know, at least, you know, it's only ten minutes we're talking about. We're not talking about hours. But if you compare it to China, for example, from Beijing to Shanghai, they're building a brand new train line which is going to travel six hundred kilometers, you know, per second. And that's going to cut, uh, tr you know, travel times by two or three hours at least. And um, so, so if you're talking about saving hours in, in your journey, then it could make you could make absolute hundred percent sense because to go from if they kept the line from London to Manchester, and it saves like two hours of the journey, or London to Glasgow, it saves three four hours. It, it would make absolute sense, and everyone would just buy it, you know. But but to save 10 minutes to get to Birmingham, it just makes no sense whatsoever. I spend all that money, it's just it's just a waste. And also he mentioned that these trains are not real high-speed trains. And they're they're quite old technology. These are they're um, not even they are not even like a, they, I think the maximum they travel is 250 miles an hour. But he says they, they're not gonna even travel 250 miles an hour because um uh, the, the safe um, traveling distance with those trains is going to be around 150 because um, to go 250 miles an hour, you have to make sure your train tracks are 100% straight. Yeah. And it's, it's, in England, you know, to make the train tracks 100% straight um, is is just too costly for them because uh, that means... Um, so what, that, what they're doing, that these lines are very curvy and bumpy, and um, and he said the the maximum these trains will go is 150 miles an hour. So they're not even real high speed rail. I mean, in China you have 
the train's going 350 kilometers per second and oh sorry no, per hour I mean, sorry. <laughs> I'm doing, yeah per hour and um and, and these trains you can put um a coin on the windowsill and this coin okay. wouldn't even move they're, they're so they're so hundred they're so straight and they're so smooth and and there's, there's so many problems basically basically they're just wasting all that money and they're not going to get that money back because they've spent most of it they spent like 130 billion already and uh, and yeah it's just a shame the uh, you know the, the british right you know every time the, every time when it comes to china wanting to help you know the china wanting to help in the nuclear stuff or nuclear power plants or or like any infrastructure projects uh, th there's a couple of people in the um, you know, Parliament, who just keep jumping up. I'm talking about people like Ian Duncan Smith. Ian yeah. Duncan Smith, yeah, he just jumps up. Says, oh no, China! You you can't let China come in and do this. Well, you can't. You know, China's going to put cameras in the tracks and you know. Spy <laughs> <cameras>. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely ridiculous. The system in um, in China, AJ, the system is is fantastic. I use it all the time. I'd much rather use the train than plane. If you, if I want to fly from Zhongshan, it takes me two hours to get to the pretty much the nearest airport. There is a, an airport at Shenzhen, and they've they just cancelled it during the COVID and never brought it back. There used to be a ferry straight to the airport, but there's not any more. So it's a two hour drive or it's even longer by train to get to Shenzhen because it's the wrong side of the river. The The new bridge will open up. Another new bridge will open up soon. But traveling traveling by plane for me from Zhongshan takes me two hours to get to the airport. I have to be there two hours, at least an hour earlier. And so there's three hours that I've lost before I even get on a plane, which quite often they're late. Uh, quite often they're, you know, you get on a plane and they say you can't switch your laptop on until we've been in the air 20 minutes. You must switch it off 40 minutes before you land. All these stupid regulations. I go from my home and nine hours later, I'm checking into a hotel in Beijing. Simple as that. And I've worked or read a book or on my laptop all the way without any issues so the but the other systems the, the old green trains still exist and they're really fun to catch i just wrote an article about that actually my my first ever adventure in china was catching the green train to xi'an um that, so you, you've got the three different systems the, the the slow train and then you've got an intercity style train which goes slower it's a it's 150 kilometers an hour and it goes it stops regularly. So it takes me 40 minutes to get to Guangzhou, which is 100 kilometers away, or it takes me 27 minutes to get to Guangzhou, depending on which train I catch. If I'm catching the express train, I go to a different station. There are two stations. So the express train will take me all the way around China. I can get on a train in Zhongshan and get off the train in Beijing or in Shanghai or, or any one of a hundred cities, it doesn't matter. But the slower train is really convenient, more like more like a commuter's train, like my dad used to catch from Essex into London, except uh -huh. much more comfortable, much faster, and cleaner, much cleaner. So, yeah, there's a lot of good one. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah, going all out. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, change the topic now. And let's, yeah, talk about, the topic. Um, let's talk about other stuff that's going on around the world. So we have... Um, we have the media blowing up uh, an Iranian attack to Israel. Um, they're saying it's going to happen within 48 hours. I don't think it will because um, Iran is much more smarter than that. And I'm sure Iran's getting lots of advice from Russia and China to yeah. be, be patient. But, but all, all of the papers, you see, oh, they're going to attack within 48 hours, 24 hours. And and the, and basically, um, this article here with, with Lord Cameron, he says... Um, if Iran strikes, Britain must take it on. In, in, so he's saying that Britain will go to war with Iran. That's what he's saying. I mean, um, I just don't understand the British. Um, British sometimes they, they just bombed Yemen. They're bombing. Um, they were bombing Iraq, Afghanistan, pretty much all of the Middle East. The, the Palestine problem is because of the British. I just don't understand why we just can't be neutral and just keep our nose out of it. I mean, what's your thoughts, Anna? We'll start with you. Well, first. this British imperialism, loud and clear, what what people are forgetting is that, um, because we are talking about the United States of amnesia, is that at the, um, I think it's early 2023, 
Netanyahu begged America to join it in um, a war on Iran. And as we know, Netanyahu was being prosecuted in Israel. He's not that he wasn't the most popular. There were demonstrations against him when he tried to power this power grab against um, against the judges. So he he's turned down. America says, no, we're not going to go to war with with Iran. Are you mad? Then we get October the 7th. So then Netanyahu gets his um, gets his wish, basically, you know, bu building up to to this and all the stuff that they've been doing to the Palestinians for the last six, seven months now, six months. And um, and now you get them just to make sure that he gets his, his war, because you can tell America's trying to circumnavigate this. They don't want to be embroiled in a, a regional war there. But he went and bombed the embassy in Syria, in, D in Damascus, completely in contravention of the uh, Vienna Convention. You know, I think the, the only other time I can think of when this happened was in 1998 and the bombing of the Chinese embassy in former Yugoslavia. And America immediately apologised, said, no, no, it's a mistake. It's, it's a mistake. But now you've got, you know, I, I mean, they've killed Soleimani. They assassinated him. This is un, was unheard of, you know, previously to somebody of that that um, status. They've bombed the embassy. They've killed Iranian people on their turf. This is a declaration of war. So again, you have this co complete um, delusion that's being spun. That's and this reversal. It's so Orwellian, you, you, you know. Uh, war is peace, the Ministry of Truth and all that, that it's Iran is starting this because they got in their time machine and are going to be committing a war after the provocation has occurred. So mm. I think this is really dangerous. And of course, you've got Bible Belt Christians who want to bring on Armageddon and all that. And so you've got this unholy mix of um, holy um, spectres, you know, com coming into play. It's dangerous. Britain, oh my God, please, Britain, stay out of this. It's they're killing. This is like this is mass murder. It's conspiracy to mass murder. Whether it's in Europe and in, in Ukraine, whether whether it's in the the Middle East, whether it's Asia, it's like you shall know them by the trail of death. I'm inclined to agree. Uh, and I'm inclined to agree also with Bob here, this Israeli strike was bait. Um, they want. Now, the next thing, of course, is if Iran is involved in this, there will be screams that China is supporting them in the same way that there was screams that China was tacitly supporting and then uh, um, actively supporting Russia, which they were never doing. Uh, you know, the, the, the allegations, again, without any evidence, without any proof. So the screaming will be, you know, the, uh, Iran Iran can only only do this because they're a member of the SCO and China is is the leader of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, SC uh, organization, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO. Now, China does lead that organization for sure, and Iran has just joined it, but it's not a military. It's, it's a trade. Uh, it does have some uh, concept of um, anti-terrorism that they're sharing, but China is definitely not supporting, but that is going to be the, the call. So yeah. it's, it's all bait. It's all one step salami slicing towards a, a conflict with China. Now, the biggest problem with all of this is just a few months ago, they started on this operation, uh, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember the name of the operation. It had a pathetic name where they were going to go and strike Yemen and stop Yemen from stopping the ships. Well, that's failed miserably. Now they're trying to negotiate with Yemen. They've pretty much said to Yemen, you can have anything you want if you stop doing this. And Yemen have said, we want one thing. We want Israel to stop doing that. Um, you can't have that. So the, the, they've completely failed in Yemen. They failed in Afghanistan after 20 years. They failed in Iraq. They're still failing in Iraq. They have failed in Syria. They have failed in Libya. 
they're not going to do anything positive here. And yesterday, it was all over Twitter again yesterday. How close is Iran to developing a nuclear weapon? Because for at least 20 years, I've been seeing that they're only weeks away from doing it. This is the longest few weeks of my entire life. But also so, everyone forgets what happened in 1953. Do you remember yeah. they, had, they had Mossadegh, you know, democratically elected? And what happened, you, you had um, British oil interests overthrowing America yeah. goes in. Oh, God, there's a really book, brilliant book on this by an American. Author. I can't think of what, what, what it's called, but it's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you, you have them doing their usual. They disrupted and <coughs> overturned the government in Iran. They create all this chaos. They bring in their Shah, who is, let's just say, wasn't very democratic, um, very brutal. And that was their man. And mm. now they keep acting like, like they're, they're keeping the peace, they're, you know, the, the policemen of the world. But, wow, they just go, go around wrecking everything. Mm. I, I, I can actually add a little bit to that. I was actually conceived in Iran. It was called Persia at the time. Oh, my father was working in the oil industry in Abadan. And my mother went out there for, and basically, he was there for several years. My mother went out there for uh, quite some time. My oldest brother lived there for a while. My next brother was almost born there and uh, mum came home and she she had one baby at home and then she went back to Abadan with two kids and um, came home just before I was born and never went back so I've never been to Iran or Persia but uh, I come from there wow I think, yeah <laughs> that's an interesting story according to my brother he, he was born on a bus in Abadan he tells people that all the time um, <laughs> He used to get me to back him up at school when he was in trouble. You back to, where was I born? Tell him where I was born. Yeah, I was on a bus in Iran, in Persia. Persia. It was just his his little go to story. But yeah, it, it, yeah it, it, there's nothing going to happen that's good about this. Nothing at all. And I think uh, somebody put the comment up a little while ago that Iran has been extremely patient and shown a great deal of restraint. I agree. Iran is entitled in my opinion, to retaliate, but they haven't. See, we're Westerners. We, uh, you know, Anna, Anna's probably got a different point of view. Uh, I'm a Westerner. I come from this uh, ideal that, you know, if, if someone has wronged us, we can wrong them back. But Chinese people would say, oh, no, we, we'll wait our turn. Karma will take care of this. And, and there's a very different attitude. But I feel that Iran has has displayed incredible restraint. So has China, but I mean, Iran really needs credit for that. Yeah, I mean, if you look back in history, when Chinese uh, embassy got bombed in uh, in Serbia, and mm -hmm. and everybody was saying, "Oh, Chinese are going to attack." Chinese, gonna... I mean, I, I don't remember because I was I was a kid then, but um, I do remember I, I do remember reading some articles and stuff on, from the past, and I, I saw a lot of articles about how. China's going to retaliate and they're going to fight with NATO and, you know, things are going to get really ugly and, and stuff like that. But China never never did retaliate. They just, they were patient. They were building up their military. They were building up their economy. And now, you know, if the Chinese embassy gets bombed, nobody would dare to do it because China is now too strong. And, and I think Iran should do the same. They should be patient until they are, you know. You know they're, they're, sorry, go they're, on. That there is a practical reason for this as well. I mean, Mao always said, and I'm sure it goes back to the art of war, and that, that you'd never do what your enemy wants you to do. Yeah, yeah. And, Agreed, and Netan yeah. Netanyahu has been begging for this, we know, since at least early 2023. So, you know, why would you do what they want to do? And it's awful. The pain there, you know, there have been people killed in, in, in Lebanon. There are people being killed in West Bank. There are people being killed. But it, it's like you've got to grit your teeth and hold on because they are. Israel is going absolutely bonkers and going going around trying to provoke this regional war, which, will, of course, will keep him in power and keep him out of prison. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if I was a if I was a running Iran, if I was the leader of Iran, and I saw the Western article saying Iran's going to attack Israel in forty eight hours, I'm just going to look at that and say I'm not going to give in to these Western 
timetable. I've got if I have a if I want to attack Israel, it will be under my terms. You know, it does doesn't need to be forty eight hours. It can be next year or ten years later or twenty years later. I'm not going like, to sit here and you know do it in forty eight hours because the Western media told me to. It's just ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just um, there's no common yeah. sense. If, if if you were standing for election for uh, the leadership of Iran, I would vote for you, AJ, for sure. <laughs> um, but but you're right. I would suspect that Iran right now is causing all sorts of chatter and traffic on on the um, the Ethernet, so that the listening agencies are, haven't got a clue what's going on. And then suddenly, what they'll do is they'll stop. All chatter will stop, and that's deliberate because now everyone says it's going to happen in 24 hours or 48 hours, and then it doesn't happen. And everyone looks back, well, what the hell? We cried Rolf again. So then Iran picks up the chatter and chatter, 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 and, and then stops. And then it's going to be another announcement is happening in the next 24 hours, and it doesn't happen again. This is what I would be doing if I was Iran. I'd just be playing cat and mouse with these people. And, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what needs to happen, I think. Just show them, prove them to be wrong, as they have been on almost every prediction that has ever been said about what Iran is going to do, it's almost 100% wrong. It's just like the China collapse theory. It's 100% wrong. It's never going to happen. Martial arts. I think, I think there's martial arts being engaged. And anyone who's done Kung, Kung Fu on here, you know, you've got this sticky hands exercise where you keep yeah. contact with, with your with your opponent, but you don't mm. strike at the first, you don't lurch in and, and, and just try and bash your opponent. You're more intelligent about it and using what's happening in the real world and all these all these different factors. You know, it's it's actually America, and we saw after 9-11 the, the Patriot Act, you know, America lashed out. It resulted in the the, the deaths of millions of, of Muslims and you know pe people all over their their, yeah. their their sphere. So do they really want this again? Have they not learned from what happened back then? Yeah, that's that's very true. There's a there's a lot of things to be said. If Iran does take any action, ultimately America will lose, but ultimately tens of thousands hundreds of thousands potentially millions of people will be de will be homeless destitute many will be dead it, it, it this this is not the answer and iran probably knows this I, i'd be very surprised if they do actually do something i certainly hope they don't but i'd be mm -hmm. very i do believe that they're entitled to uh, pb has said time is on iran and china's yeah. side just sit and wait and he's right because you know you can see Israel collapsing from within. I mean, I don't know if this regime can last too much longer. They're bleeding so much money, um, you know, fighting uh, Hamas, for example. They're yep. fighting Lebanon. Um, they're bleeding so much money. The, the economy is um, being cut to shreds because their ports um, like Haifa and Iliad are, are not working. Most people are, are not working in Israel. They've all been drafted um, to fight this war. Uh, and you know, Israel is just bleeding money. The West mm. is the West is losing money as well. They can't even afford to give any money or weapons to Ukraine anymore. Um, you know, you see the huge inflation issues. You see Yellen coming to China to beg to buy some more bonds for other countries to buy bonds. And I mean, I, I look at the stocks and shares. And on Friday, the stocks took a massive tumble. Uh, the bit, Bitcoin fell off a cliff. Um, the S&P 500 fell off a cliff as well, only because there was so much talks about, oh, there's going to be a war between uh, Iran and Israel. But um, it's all just jargon, really. I, I think... We know that war makes profits. This is the problem. You know, we know what mis human misery will come out of it. but And we know that it will be expensive because so much will be destroyed. But we also know you've probably got BlackRock and God knows who else, you know, waiting in the wings, rubbing their hands with glee. This is going to make us a fortune. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, uh, the gold prices shot up on Friday because yeah. um, everyone thought there's going to be a war. So the gold prices just went up by, you know, it just you just went up like a like like uh, like a rocket because everyone thought there's going to be a war. 
But then once uh, people realize uh, Iran's not going to attack, then gold started falling again. But yeah, you can you can make a lot of money in the stock market if you just if you tell all the um, like for example if the, if you tell all the me- if you own all the media companies and and you tell them all oh just tell them just put this article saying Iran's going to attack in 48 hours and you just bet your money on gold short the stock exchange and you can make a lot of money from it and i think that's what they've probably been doing just making profit out of fear really i agree with that market manipulation that's exactly yeah. what this is yeah there yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I want to talk about Britain's role um, in the Middle East. I mean, we we as a country, right, we have um, destroyed our relationship with China. Uh, we have destroyed our relationship with Russia. We have destroyed our relationship with the EU after Brexit. We have destroyed our relationship with all of Middle East. Um, we have destroyed our relationship with Africa. When you, when you can go back to the slave trade and things like that. You know, we just don't have much friends left apart from America and Israel <laughs> and, and maybe possibly Japan and you Australia. Know, Australia, yeah, Australia and New Zealand. America are not your friends, AJ. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and uh, you know, look, uh, if you think about it, America can still stand on its own because, you know, they've got huge land, they've got a huge population, they've got, they, they create, you know, lots of oil and gas, uh, and they've got a huge economy, so they can survive. But we as a country, you know, our, our gas reserves and oil reserves are going dwindling by the day in the North Sea. It's just disappearing. Our economy is going down. Cost of living is shooting up. Um, you know, our manufacturing is becoming close to zero. And, I, and once this EV boom starts happening, all these, uh, once these fossil fuel cars gets, gets um, you know, once people stop making fossil fuel cars, because that's our main industry is cars, right? We, we have, you know, lots of great cars like Rolls-Royce and Jaguar, Aston Martin, you know, Bentley. And we do great cars, but these are all gas guzzling cars. We don't have any EV, you know, any EV like cars or factories in UK. And once um, once this EV revolution fully Go, goes ahead in the rest of the world, we're just going to be left behind. We'll have zero manufacturing left. We'll have no cars. Everything, all the other manufacturing is pretty much dead in UK. British Steel is dead because the company who bought it, I think it was a Tata, they, um, they took the government money and they ran. They, they just closed down all the factories in all British Steel. Yeah, they, yeah. they just closed all the factories. So British industry manufacturing is pretty much dead. And then and now Britain is just going around making enemies with the rest of the world, and especially the Middle East and China. But who is this? This um, you know, when you talk about Britain, you're talking about a feral elite who are basically pillaging. It, it's like a scorched earth policy that they've got go, going on. You, you know, they, they, they've sold off all the NHS data to um, uh, what's his name, Peter Thiel. You know, who who, who campaigned for Brexit. You know, I mean, this is a whole other other conversation about Brexit and why that took took place and the damage that it was doing. And, you know, my shock at people on the left not even being able to look deeply at, at the, the what was going on behind the scenes. But they are stealing everything you had. I don't know. During Covid, you had Dido Harding. Yeah. Who was um, fronting the, the loss of 32 billion pounds for Test and Trace what happened to that you've got michelle moan who nicked I, th- I think there's something like 230 million that went through her husband's company and she got a nice big chunk chunk of that um you've you've got a whole load of people it's, it's like every day you're you're hearing ab- about people who are waltzing off with with millions and millions and hundreds of millions meanwhile they're prosecuting we know that they've prosecuted the post office masters when they knew they knew what was happening and, and that um the software had access to that the, these people's accounts you've got now people carers who've saved this country you, you know god knows how much billions being prosecuted for going 30p over the the line and being prosecuted and hounding for the whole amount that they've claimed 
yeah, in, in, in benefits. So it's like this can't go on for much longer. It's like the end of the before the French Revolution, where you saw all these abuses going madder and madder on the part of the, the Ancien Regime. And then you got the French Revolution. And I'm just wondering, well, are people going to start kicking up? People are sort of wiping the sleep out of their eyes and realising, oh, something's going wrong. And these people are just ruthless and reckless. I also want to know what happened to um, Epstein's black book, because it's quite obvious that there, there, there was some sort of a, a blackmail um, thing go, go, going on there, because suddenly they get all these world leaders on board, you know, not just politics, but in industry. Suddenly everyone's on board for the for the um, for the project, for the Get China project. And ultimately, I see the target not as China. China's the big target at the end of one um, one avenue, but ultimately, it is the it, it it is labor, the labor force across the world. I believe that the American elite and the other elites that are following them want to do to us what they did to the Native Americans. They don't care about us. You just look at Gaza. It's like for all they care. The whole world could end up looking like Gaza, but they want to maintain their position right at the top of a heap, a heap of the rubble of their making. Mm. Exactly. I've just pulled up another article where Keir Starmer has said um, he'll happily press the nuclear button if UK gets attacked. Well, let me tell you, UK is actually pushing Russia to its limit. You know, UK, there's UK forces, you know, on the ground in Ukraine and they're looking to kind of poke the bear as well. So they are actively going out, bombing other countries like Yemen. They want to bomb Iran. They're, they're you know, actively um, poking the bear with Russia. So they're the ones instigating fights with other countries. So if they retaliate, he, Keir Starmer saying, oh, I'll, I'll just press the nuclear button. I mean, what kind of um, language is that from the next prime minister? I mean, if I was... If I was becoming the next prime minister, I, I would, you know, be a lot more kind of um, tactful with with that kind of question. I just say, you know, obviously, you you wouldn't, you know, nobody wants to press the nuclear button or or something like that. Or you know, we we would go around looking for peace rather than war. But but this guy straight away, so he says, oh, I'm just going to press the nuclear button. No talk of peace. No talk of negotiations. No nothing. Exactly what's happening with Ukraine, where they're not talking peace at all. They're just pushing for war, 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 send weapons. And, and it's just it's just crazy. And it's just going to be exactly the same with Starmer, with with Sunak. It doesn't really matter who sits, sits on, the, on the throne, really. They're, they're all just working for the same WEF, you know. Um, but you know what would happen if Sir Keir Starmer didn't say that when he was asked that question? The answer would be Sir Keir Starmer refuses to rule out pushing the nuclear button. Mm. So in other words, the headline would be pretty much the same thing. So yeah. it doesn't make any difference whether he said it or not. Um, you know, it, the, the bottom line is any prime minister would do what any leader of any country would do to protect their own country. Um, but here's an interesting thing. China is the only country in the world with nuclear weapons that has said we will not first strike unless we are attacked with nuclear weapons first. Mm -hmm. uh, several other countries have said we will not first strike nuclear weapons, but there's always a condition about it. Uh, India has said we will not first strike against a smaller country. We'll only first strike against China or America or Pakistan because Pakistan's got as many as they have, but they won't first strike against an unarmed nuclear country. So you, you've got this kind of strange thing going on there with nuclear weapons and, and you know what they're going to do. But China is the only country in the world that has actually stated, and they said it at Mao's time way back in the 1950s or 60s when they did their very first test, they would not be the person to do the first strike. There you go, send troops to Ukraine, but not at the front line. Well, what, what happens when those troops die? <laughs> exactly. When those troops get killed, then they say, look, Russians are killing Brits now. Yeah, I mean, look, as soon as you put troops in Ukraine, they're going to be a target for Russian missiles. 
you know, and, and Russia is going to see them. They're not going to be a target for them, AJ. They're just going to be there when the target gets hit. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of Brits and a lot of Americans already dead in Ukraine. They're just keeping quiet about the numbers. There's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. But but they all, in Britain, they're also talking about having a cons conscription as well. And I don't know about you, but the British, the British youngsters and the people who grew up in Britain, nobody here is ready for war. I mean, everyone's gone woke really i mean everyone the gen z and and, and all the people that grew, grew up in the 70s 80s 90s i think britain has got used to not being in battle and not being in wars and stuff. Remember, it's only like five six years ago when it seemed everything there was this equilibrium that was developing as china had helped the world the global economy out of america's um, great crash of 2008 which threatened to, to wreck the global economy, everything, everything has been been stabilizing, and you even had it was even feeling more peaceful. You, you know, there was this gen general good feel for everybody except for the elites, and it's incredible. In well, well, it, it's Trump who accelerated it with his war on on China. We know now that he even had a special. Um, department, propaganda departments set up to get a character assassinate uh, China. Um, you, you know, and I think we remember this. We have certain ideals how the world is supposed to be. Um, it's also been, this has all been a big distraction from the damage that Brexit did to our economy. The fact that we're being sold off to private Enterprise. Remember the the um, the business secretary Wilbur Ross actually told American businessmen to feast upon the UK, which was which was being damaged so so badly. They, they blame it on COVID. I mean, all the yeah, damage. Yeah. That's why I think, but that is why I believe COVID. You know, considering America, the pen, the, the the Pentagon was briefing NATO and Israel about the coming pandemic in November 2019. Mm. This is what this is why you know the whole narrative about it was it was all you know a leak at the in Wuhan. You know the Chinese were the first to discover it and identify it. It was already um going on in America, Iran, strangely, Italy, strangely, as being the first European country to sign up to um, the Belt and Road. So all of this stuff, which you can't discuss in the mainstream. Yeah. They, they've cancelled it now. I think Italy's left the Belt and Road. Now, because, because yeah, unfortunately, this is what happens. You, 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 you had this stability um, before Trump start, start, started his, his uh, tra trade war on China. And you had a lot of people looking to... To China, you know, Britain we know was looking to China to get it out of uh, its economic doldrums. Across the world, you had had this, so it's taken all that time to chip away. I mean, I remember re reading um, the think tanks. There's what one was it Simsec that that was saying this is this is our objective. What we have to do is get the American taxpayers on board for a conflict with China. Hmm. So everything has been aimed at that. This is their objective. This is what they want to do. And unfortunately, because the fourth estate is no longer doing its job as the fourth estate, that's the press that's supposed to be holding um, power to account. What you what you now have is this consensus, 100 percent consensus in the mainstream um, that China is the big bad and we have to go to war with it. What this means is the rest of us, ordinary people, you know, are going to suffer. We're either going to be killed or it means we can't afford nice things. There could be famine. Um, climate change is, is, is getting worse and worse. Who knows what's going to happen with the next pandemic, you know, um, for all to serve a minority in the West. True. That's right. Uh, and this this is a good little find. This one it was it was only uh, released today that the Italian Prime Minister is planning to come to China 
which uh, I, I believe that she was given uh, an ultimatum. Um, Italy does not fit in the G7 anymore. It, it's, it's too small. There are several, many countries, in fact, larger than Italy that should be in the G7. Uh, India, for example, uh, because they say India has shared values. It's a democracy. It's the world's largest democracy. Now, I use the inverted commas there because obviously the, the values that India shares are not the same as America shares. Um, you've got why is India not in the G7? Why is Italy in the G7? Why is Spain not in the G7? Uh, when all and, and UK will be dropping out of it fairly soon as well, by all accounts. So you've got this strange situation where Italy is a member of the G7, and the Prime Minister went to America a week later declared that the Belt and Road Initiative was not suitable for Italy, so she tore it up, effectively tore it up. And now they're saying, well, Italy's got a real problem, and one of its biggest markets has always been China. Chinese people love Italian fashion. They love Italian food. I mean, the, in, in my city where I live, in Zhongshan, if I want to eat anything that's not Chinese, I can only eat Italian. There's no Indian restaurants, there's no French restaurants, there's no Thai restaurants. It's Italian or it's Chinese. Uh, and that's that's because people here love it. The, Italy is Italy should be China's friend, and I think probably it will become so. But if it's the, mo the moment it signs a, a BRI memorandum again, it's out of the G7. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it seems like um, it's very cheeky of her to do so. I mean... I mean, look, I've been following Italy in the Belt and Road for years now. And when they joined, within a year, there was articles coming out of Italy saying, oh, we need to leave um, the Belt and Road. It's not giving us any benefits. And they've only been on it for a year. I mean, how, how do you expect, do you expect uh, Belt and Road to give you immediate benefits within a year? I mean, uh, this what, is a long-term project. And, what uh, did happen with Italy was that the imports from China increased, but exports <laughs> Excuse me. Exports to China decreased, and that is a fact. Uh, but that's that's a fact because Italy didn't work very hard at it. I mean, there, there are so many Italian products, Italian agriculture, Italian fashion, uh, even Italian cars. You hardly ever see a Fiat here in in China. They're very rare, but they're beautiful little cars, and China would love to have them but the, you don't see them. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of Ferraris and Lamborghinis. There's, in fact, there's, a, there's an interesting statistic. There's probably more Ferraris and Lamborghinis than there are Fiat's in the city where I live, probably wow. in China. <laughs> yeah, be, because there's so much money here. Uh, not just my city, the whole of the greater Bay Area where I live and all yeah, the East Coast, yeah. you'll see Ferraris and Lambos all the time. Um, and um, what's the other? Maserati. Very popular car here, mm. a Maserati. Very popular indeed. It's a lot of them, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the like the big family sedan and the SUVs. Very, the Italians very love their sports cars. They're very, you know, they're very world famous when it comes to sports mm. and, and their fashion. Yeah, you know, you, some of the biggest fashion labels are Italian. Yep. So, um, yeah. and the Chinese love it. I mean, there's Chinese um, that come to UK f to study. I always see them in shopping centers, walking around with designer bags and you know all these um, designer gear. Because they come here and, and, and all they do is shop in designer stuff, especially the mm -hmm. Italian stuff. Uh, yeah. I think that one of the, um, I think was it, was it the Australian minister or, or said that, you know, we're basically um, scaring away the Chinese students because not only do they pay full tuition fees, mm -hmm. but they also help our economy by buying all these good, expensive goods. Yep, uh, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. And they, uh, they were buying apartments and houses too, which which caused some upset. Uh, some people there, there was a as Murdoch Press again went ballistic on the fact that uh, two percent of the foreign owned houses in Australia belonged <coughs> to Chinese people. So I mean, it was tiny number, but it caused a huge impact, and and of course it causes more people to dislike China and the Chinese, and look how bad the Chinese are. They're buying all of our um, all of our stuff. Uh, anyway, China has the most millionaires, but not yet the most billionaires. Not yet. It will have. So I've got like uh, one more, I think one more article. Oh, yeah. So we have 
Maloney going to China. We have um, Schultz going to China. We had Yellen in China. We've had all these other, like Macron, um, Mac Macron is coming as well. Uh, but no British delegate <laughs> coming to China. I think the last British delegate that went to China was cleverly, but he was like, yeah. useful. I remember his speech. He was, uh, he was absolutely. Uh, well, talking. his speech at the Lord Mayor's, um, I went viral with that. It got translated into Cantonese and Mandarin, and it was posted in all kinds of different places. I wrote an open letter to James Cleverly. It mm. went huge. I mean, it literally has had millions of views. Wow. I, I've never been so famous in my life. You know, I, <laughs> people stopping me in the street for a photograph. It, it really was. It was an amazing oh, okay. experience uh, because you know, within a day of me writing it, my wife was saying, "Have you heard this guy?" And there's a guy talking in Cantonese on the phone, and he's and he, she said he's quoting you. I said, no, he's reading my letter in Cantonese, and that's <laughs> what he was doing. Uh, and it got. Have uh, a link. Could, could, um, could, could you link uh, that? Yeah, I can, I can get you one. It was published in China Daily in Chinese and in uh, Global Times in English. And That's it was published in um, Pearls and Irritations too right. in Australia. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I'll just do... It's just called Open Letter to James Cleverly. But you didn't you to... think he... Cleverly is somebody who obviously knows what time it is. But he's being dragged. They're all being dragged to the right by these absolute nutters. I, th I think in Tufton Square, is it? You know, Liz, Liz Truss's lot that are, are basically in bed with the worst of the American. Um, right. Oh, I, I, I found it, guys. I'll put, post you on the chat. Thank you. There you go. Did you find it in Chinese or English? No, China Daily English. So, oh, yeah, how, yeah. how come you can post? It's letting you, you, you post links, but it won't let me. It's cutting all my links, all, all my contributions have been. It knows you, Anna. Oh, I'm not no, sure. Why. That's incredible. I mean, I'm glad because I can read it, but it's like I'm trying to post uh, articles on. Oh, on, really? Um, and it's it's just graying them out, and it's saying it won't. It, it oh, won't. That's strange. Yeah. Yeah, James Cleverly was very disappointing. Before he came out here, he made a speech at the Lord Mayor's um, Easter lunch. So this is a, a year and a bit ago, I think. Then he came out here and he had good meetings. He had positive meetings, but he made a very, very snarky tweet from the airport, you know, did, did the, the selfie thing and, and said how he had told China what they needed to be told. You know, he wasn't <laughs> going to be stuffed around by the Chinese. <laughs> and, and I... I I just got so angry about this. I wrote him an open letter and said, you know, I mean, I, I know people who voted for him as well, uh, you know, because he, he's from Braintree in Essex, which uh, Anna and I both know that area quite well. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand these British diplomats. I mean, look, it, it doesn't really pay to annoy China to this level because at the end of the day, Britain, Britain and China are still the biggest trading partners and China is soon is going to be the number one economy in the world. And if you're going to make an enemy out of China, you are losing, basically. And everybody else is making friends. Like even America is going there and France is going there, Germany is going there, Italy is going there, Spain is you know, going there. Every, every top a leader from every top nation is going to China. To you know what happens, though, if they stand up? Because there was a time, believe it or not, when Boris Johnson had a bit of a spine. So in February 2020, he gets this phone call from, um, from Trump shouting at him, saying, why haven't you um, banned Huawei yet? And for a year, they've been putting pressure on 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 blow Joe to to do this now give you know I, I mentioned before that that the Johnson family actually have investments in China because they saw China as being the, the way forward so Johnson and GCHQ um stood up they they um that they, they resisted this and in fact uh Kim Darrick who was the former ambassador a uh, British ambassador to to, to America you know, has said that there is absolutely no evidence there's anything wrong with Huawei. Mm. GCHQ said not only have we investigated, but they let on. They had to reveal the fact that they actually had people in Huawei 
right? That's how deep the investigation went. And they found absolutely nothing wrong with it. But he was threatened and threatened. You saw the press being very bad for him. I mean, we know he's a, you know, he's a clown and a, a not you know, and other various things were wrong with him as well. But they really went to town on him. Um, Mike Pence said darkly, yeah, we know what, um, they've had our message and they know what this means. Pompeo had gone over and, and, and shouted at, at the British as well. And eventually, later that year, he capitulated and he, that he agreed to that by 2027, all the Huawei kit would be ripped out. You know, all our investments in Huawei and 5G didn't count for anything. We're still on 4G. But there was a carrot and stick because then he was offered this loan, you know, this mysterious loan that the um, person he had appointed to the BBC arranged. Mm. Um so it's carrot and stick. They they threaten you, and I'm sure there's lots of stuff they could threaten him him with. And it got quite thuggish the, the language. And then he capitulated. And and as we were saying about Cam Cameron as well, we just don't know. We can't imagine the pressure that is being put on these people to capitulate to to America's demands. Mm. <laughs> There's, Boris there's Johnson had the weakest. Yeah, Boris Johnson had the weakest uh, spine. I mean, that guy was. Uh, he mean, did no. The point I'm making, though, AJ, yeah. is that there is a point where he was standing up to them, and it was over yeah. the course of a year, right? Yes, he did do things that they wanted. Like, for example, one of the first things he did when he got in in June 2019, the following month was that he dis disbanded the British pandemic team. Yeah, Which, around the same time that Trump was disbanding the um, the Beijing CDC office, and he'd already uh, a year or two earlier gotten gotten rid of the, their pandemic team. So all this stuff is happening in concert, you know. And then, mm. oh look, a few months later, we get a pandemic in China. How strange! Mm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, even Boris and his successors, they've all out outsource their foreign policy to the Americans. So whatever the Americans do, the British are the first to follow. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. Like uh, when China had the Beijing Olympics, the Americans said they're going to boycott it, not send, any send anyone there. And the British are the first to kind of stand up and say, oh, we're, we're not going to send anyone there either. And um, they seem to be the first to jump and say, like, oh, we, we, they, they do everything the Americans do. And I'm, I'm sure that if, if America basically um, starts having great relations with China again, Britain will come uh, falling back. Oh, again. oh yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just, they, they, they seem to, they, I, I do remember a time when Britain had an independent foreign policy. I mean, I think I wasn't born then, but I think I, I'm, re I'm reading like, for example, during the Vietnam War times when Britain said, no, we're not going to join you in the Vietnam War. Uh, Harold so Wilson. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, there yeah. was a time when Britain was a very, like, a calming influence to the Americans. The, the Americans are quite gung-ho, right? They love war, don't they? I mean, these, guy, these guys are, you know, raised in the Wild West. They love killing. They, they, they love wars and fighting. And Britain, you know, British, we're supposed to be the um, sophisticated, you know, uh, you know, intelligent, you know, don't think with your emotions, think with your brain and you know, calming influence to the American. We've been calming to them for for for, for quite a long time. Then I think it came, I think Blair changed it all during the Iraq War, and um, since then we've just been absolute puppets. And saying when America says jump, we just say how how high. It's, it's, it's quite there's, a couple, there's a couple of factors there, AJ. One is that during that period of time when Harold Wilson was uh, making that decision, they couldn't afford a war. Britain was was basically broke. Uh, they were still paying back the Lend-Lease until, I think, 2002. It took 60 years to pay off the Second World War, and the Korean War didn't help. They were involved in that, and I think they just said, hang on, you know, we just can't afford to keep doing this. And that may have had a, a very, very strong impact on um, what was happening during that period of time for Britain being as stable or having the stability there. So that was one aspect of it. The other aspect is that um, Australia 
is even worse. Now, I just did a, a bit of research for a, a show that I'm involved in called The Three M's on, on YouTube. And we talked just recently about how the Americans can control. They literally control the banking system. They control the they they control every aspect of um, of Australian life. I didn't look at the British in any great respect, but they they control the health, they control the education, they control the finance, they're controlling mining and resources, they're controlling the gas, they're controlling the government as well. They're controlling the intelligence community and the defense community, and they're controlling it, not influencing it. They control it. They have control of Australia. And then when Australia says, we're going to make a rule or we're going to sign on to the BRI, they have this clause in their investments, which allows the corporations that own the investments in Australia to sue the government for a change of policy that might affect them. It doesn't have to actually affect them. It might affect their investments, and therefore they can sue. This is built into all of their investments. They literally have control of Australia. Now, I'm quite certain they have the same thing in, in the UK too. It may not be so deep, but you know we could look at that, and I'm sure that we'll find elements of it. But in Australia, it is really deep. It's very entrenched. It is complete control of the defense, the intelligence, the health, the uh, finance, all the banks, the big four banks are all under the control of American corporations, their assets. <laughs> That's how they do this. And then somebody added to this, what do the CIA have on every single person who stands for election in Australia? And I'm sure that the CIA have some dirt on all of us. Very true. Um, mm. be before we go to the final topic, Gaza, um, I, wa I was going to talk a little bit about Schultz as well. And um, right. the German economy is absolute, it's a nightmare at the moment. And I remember... Six months ago, Germans uh, released a white paper basically uh, um, saying they need to de-risk from China and China's uh, adversary, um, not, a, not a partner. It, it was a very scathing report on China. And basically, uh, mm. they were forcing companies you know, not to like, move to China. They were, kind of telling, they were basically threatening some German companies. If you, go, if you open up businesses in China, we're not going to support you or give you money or you know, uh, stuff like that. So the Germans have been, since, since um, Schultz came into power, they've been very, very anti-Chinese, especially Burbank and um, Habeck, I think. They've, they've yeah. been very, very anti, yeah, very, uh, very anti-Chinese hawks. And, um, and now you see all of these anti-Chinese hawks, they're all kind of slithering way into China to kind of ask for something or beg for money or, I mean, should China give them a chance? Because, I mean, uh, you got these guys who are absolutely behind your back, scathing you at every opportunity. Even the German media is very anti-Chinese, and, and Italy is the same as well. Britain's the same. But they, they all go into China to, to want business. I mean, should I, I know the Chinese are friendly to kind of let them in and, and be friendly with them and stuff, but how wary should the Chinese be of these... Um, slithering politicians who say one thing and do another. And I, I'm going to include okay. America in this as well. I can answer this one. Um, is that okay, Anna, if I go first on this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we have to remember that there is a separation from what government says and what media says government says. That's one aspect of it. Then there's a separation from what government says and what government does. So... Biden and Xi Jinping pick up the phone, talk to each other, and Biden says to Xi Jinping through his translator, because he speaks no Chinese, and I believe that uh, Xi Jinping speaks English, but they have their translators. Now, what then happens is this conversation goes along the line of, I've got to get reelected, and my people are very anti you and China. So I have to say this, this, and this, but this is what I'm actually going to do. That's what I think happens behind closed doors. To a degree. Now, when Biden comes out of a closed door meeting and someone says, you, do you still think that he's a dictator? And, and Biden goes, well, yeah, of course, he's got a different system to us. The answer is you know, Biden says he's a dictator. So he, he 
technically he is. This is a dictatorship of the proletariat, so he's the leader of that. He's the people's leader. Technically, you could say that's a dictatorship, but it's dictatorship of the people. So when, when he says these nasty things, I don't think it's taken too seriously by China. What is taken seriously is what they say when the doors are closed and the media are out. That's taken seriously. But that must then be tempered against what actions are taken in the coming weeks. Now, it doesn't mean what the media says happens. It means what really happens. And I think China is much smarter than we are. They're much better informed. I mean, they've got spy balloons, don't forget. So they're watching... <laughs> Um, so they're watching what's going on in the world, and they're saying, well, you know, they're saying this, the media are saying this, but the reality is this is what's happening. Because China, yeah, there's, there's been some changes in the economy of China, but it certainly isn't collapsing. They, they say that the, 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 the amount of shipping coming out of Hong Kong has collapsed. Well, yeah, it has, but they've opened up a, a new port in Nansha, which is shipping direct with Hong Kong uh, products. So... The, it hasn't really changed at all. It's just changed its location. But the media says one thing, and the reality is something different. They say that China's shipping to the Western world has collapsed. Well, yeah, it's dropped 10%, but it's gone up by 14% to the underdeveloped world. So China has actually got a 10% increase in its shipping, but the West can say, look at how badly China's shipping is going because they've shipped 19% less to America but they've shipped 24% more to Mexico, and Mexico have shipped 25% more to America. So America is still buying, and that's what they are doing. So China, I think, we need to look at this with a bigger picture and sort of step back and say, why are China so polite? And not just saying, you know, shut the fuck up and get lost, because <laughs> they, they don't need to, because the reality is, what America, what Germany, what France say they're going to do in public and what their media say they're going to do is not what they actually do and not what they say they're going to do when the doors close and the media get kicked out. So I think that's that's the answer to that problem. We've really got to look at whether or not the reality matches the headlines. The headlines certainly look terrible, but the reality maybe not so bad. So what do you think, Anna? What do you think of all this toing and froing, saying one thing and doing another, and and you know saying you hate China, but then going to China and begging for money and stuff? What, what do you think of all this? I think the dogs bark and the caravan moves on. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I'm just depressed in the meantime that there's all this hatred because remember it's having a, a very real effect on relations and Chinese <clears throat> and East Asians in, in in Britain, certainly in America, aren't having a, a, a very good time of this. So there's so much spite, you know. I think it's important for um, British Chinese to understand that you can be strong. We have, we have an inner, inner life. We have... Um, you know, we can think, we have original thought. We're human beings and you need to take pride in that. And you don't have to be quiet and, and, and just hope that this passes. I mean, we do hope that this storm will, will pass. Um, in, in the meantime, people are being hurt. We know of the women in America, in Atlanta, who were shot. There was an academic in Southampton who was out jogging and he was beaten up. And this was just... I think the same week as Nigel Farage had gone on some awful anti-racist tour of the South Coast, stirring all this up. So there will be all, all, all of the, this aggression to deal with. It's it's horrible. So it does have a, a real effect. But yeah, I, I, I think the hypocrisy is hilarious. And if we had a decent media, mainstream media, they would be you know giving their readers the um the true story but they won't mm. because they're interested you know who owns who owns the media is it's not democratic you've got a few oligarchs who, who and corporations who, who own our media the idea that we're a democracy is just a joke i i wrote a, an article called australia is no longer a democracy it's a murdocracy literally oh, he, he controls that government 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he does here, and of course, Fox News it was yeah. so powerful in, in America. How can one go? You see, I my theory is that um, that, that he's, uh, oh God, what's it? He, who he's married to, the Chinese, Wendy. Wendy. When, yeah. Wendy is our modern Helen of Troy. Because when she um, expressed a fondness for um, Tony Blair and what bad taste that woman has, by the way, and humiliated him, it's almost as if he became a stalker and wanted to hurt not just her, but the whole of her, uh, 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 of the Chinese race. So it's very much to me, it, it's um, the Trojan Wars that we're seeing. Yeah. I saw a report from uh, the Trump era, so we're going back four or five years, that um, Trump's daughter used to be a friend of Wendy Ding. Dung, Dung Wendy is her Chinese name, I think. And um, she got warned by the CIA that they felt she was a, 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 an intelligence officer of the Ministry of State Security. Now, I don't know how true that is because I think it might have been on Fox News, but it was one of those one of those things that caught my eye. And I thought, good God, how low can you go? This is the, you know, the this is the mother of his children or some of his children. He's got lots. But it's, all of a sudden now she's she's the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, Trojan horse is the right word. She she is the hacker. Well, Helen of Troy. She, he, 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 mm. you know, there are other things that the, the Trojan horse, but I think it it's about her that Murdoch, given he's the, one of the most powerful men on the planet, he 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 exacted his revenge, and I think part of what he's doing to China is almost part of that. So you, mm. this is how undemocratic we are. That one man's um, caprice and foibles can have this much effect, can wreck the whole world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So uh, let's move on to the final topic, which is Gaza. I wanted to kind of leave this to the end, and um, I know we're running running out of time, but it's, it's we'll, we'll we'll just go on for another five ten minutes, five ten minutes, and we'll just call it okay. a quick after that. Um, but yeah, I wanted to kind of. Um, talk about how hypocritical it is for UK to keep sending weapons to Israel while they're doing a genocide. And um, and I, I see it hypocritical because um, UK don't sell any weapons to China, for example, or, you know, any other countries, they, they use human rights as a weapon. But... Um, I mean, the whole world sees this hypocrisy. I mean, the whole world sees it. I mean, what is the point of playing this game anymore when when the whole world sees the you know the, how human rights is used as a weapon and they use human rights? Like, for example, they boycotted the Chinese uh, Winter Olympics because uh, they call they called it human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yet, yet they're selling weapons to Israel to do a, an actual genocide, which is being filmed, you know, real life. On on Twitter, you see dead bodies of children and women every single day, and uh, it, it's absolutely crazy. And there's millions of people protesting in the streets, but they're just taking no notice of it. They're just doing what they what they can. And and for Israel, they are just losing so much respect and so much. Um, you know, you, you know, they just don't have any more respect left from the world anymore. No one's going to believe a word UK says or does. Um, I don't think the UK can recover from this. I mean, what do you, what do you guys think of this? I'll start with Anna, then I'll go to you, Jerry. Well, the the degree of desperation tells you how much near the their end game that the, the West the West feels that, that they they are. And what's happened in Gaza? It's just it just makes it makes you soul sick as well. Watching this and seeing nothing being done, and of course it takes the deaths of seven aid work, workers. You know, three three Brits to really get a rise in Parliament even out of it. I mean, you know, I'm sure the politicians are seeing the same videos that we are. Yeah, but they, yeah. they don't. They don't mention anything about those Brits dying anymore. They just, it's, it's, you know, Sunak basically disappeared out of a whimper. He didn't even do anything. He just disappeared. 
Yeah, I, th I think they drop this stuff because they know they're dependent on the public having a very short attention span and uh, memory as well, because it does seem at times that we have the, the, the memories of, of goldfish. But I, I think it is so outrageous, you know, how they, they're torturing facts that we can all see, you know, I mean, I've I've been saying for a few years that I see this as an attack on 400 years of enlightenment, you know, the whole age of enlightenment that was science and fact based. And I think that's because it no longer serves our ruling class. And you now have just this feral layer at the top that want power no matter what. And it doesn't matter what the facts are. Their objective is there and nothing is going to get in the way of it. And I feel, I mean, the left have just been absolutely appalling in, certainly in Britain over the last 20 years, they left this huge vacuum. There's lots of internecine uh, fighting. Um, they've been quite disgusting on China. And we are at this point and it's like, there's no, there are a few individuals who, who keep trying to argue this and get the truth out, but there is no movement unless you have a counter movement. You know, the whole point of labor was it was labor versus capital. But now you have labor very much in service to um, capital and ca capital has, has now shriveled to this really evil entity. It's like the mask is, is off, you know, um, Scooby Doo's ripped the mask off of the villain. You see, you see who it really is underneath, and there is no movement against this. Um, and and the the theory as well, because you it's like with Occupy. Occupy was huge. You know, everyone was saying, "Oh, this is going to to make real changes." But again, it was an emotional response. They didn't have any political theory. Because remember, the communists, for, for example, in, in, in China, they needed their theory. And a lot of them were educated in France and were taking back lots of philosophical ideas. They actually thrashed out a theory by which they were going to know what they were fighting for, hold on to those ideals and actually effect a change. They weren't just writing about it. We have nothing like that here. You know, we've got this this fantastic explosion of demonstrations against the, the evils that are being done to the Palestinian people. But you have the left sort of, you know, latching on once it's already underway. They haven't really done anything to to, to get it going. In fact, you know, they, they, they were making no serious challenge to what NATO was up to in moving um, eastwards, despite their promises. So, uh, well, that's my view of what's going on right now. Jerry? You're going to move to me and ask me my view. Um, <laughs> I, I can only think there is no solution to this that allows Israel to exist in its current form. That's, that's the only way out for this. The world now recognizes what Israel has done and is doing and has been doing for the best part of 70 years. In 1947, they became a country. In 1967, I think they started to expand. I'm not sure what happened between 47 and 67, but the, the Six-Day War, the Golan Heights, all of these things have been uh, devastating to the region and just continue pretty much unabated with the support of the collective West, this, the, the Americans in particular, but also the Brits and, and also several others. Now, since I'm not even sure what year, but the two-state solution was proposed and accepted by, the, by NATO, uh, sorry, by the United Nations, definitely not by NATO, by the United Nations and countries like China signed up and agreed to that and said, yes, let's get this started. And it hasn't. It's, it's been 40 years and it still hasn't. So I honestly don't think a two-state solution will now work. Uh, you're going to have two states next door to each other, one, perhaps one even surrounding the other, which are permanently scarred by what has happened, particularly in the last few months, but the last 70 years. These two states are scarred by each other. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that the Palestinians are innocent in this. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the it is 100% Israel's fault. I don't know how it started. What I'm saying is it should never have been allowed to expand to this. And now that it has, 
I honestly do not know the solution. I don't know what can be done if Israel is to survive as a, a nation, as a state, as a country in the Middle East, something really incredible needs to happen to keep the peace in the future. And it's not just a two-state solution. I mean, it, it's it's laughable, but pick up Israel and put it in the middle of Australia where there's loads of space. And you know, they, they can make the desert bloom again, as they've done before. I don't know what if that's the answer. I don't know what the answer is. You can't put Israel into the middle of Nevada, but you cannot leave Israel as a nation, as a state, running in that area with the enmity that they have created. They've literally created martyrs and terrorists for the next several generations, in my opinion. So I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. Yeah, I go to a lot of spaces and, um, you know, I hear a lot of differing views from pro-Palestinians and pro-Israelis as well. There's a, there seems to be a lot of Israelis who are against this, uh, what right. Israel is doing as well. Um, but, you know, I'm just thinking about the, um, the the leadership. I mean, I just don't understand the arrogance of them. I mean, do, because they they probably thought because they got away with it for God knows seventy years, they've got away with it. Um, mm. They probably thought they can get away with w w doing whatever they want. The U United States and Britain will always have its back. They probably thought they can, you know, have an easy win against Hamas. They probably thought they can get rid of Hamas within a week. And now it's six months now. And, um, yeah, just uh, the whole world knows. I mean, the Gen Zs who are the youngsters um, who are on TikTok and social media, every single day they're bombarded with images of dead kids and stuff. They, these Gen Zs, they're all horrified, all of them. Like, um, they've never seen this kind of live genocide, you know. And, uh, and like, uh, that, this is one of the reasons why they're trying to ban TikTok as well, because, um, it is, yeah. you know, because they, they can control what goes out on Instagram, Facebook, but they can't control what goes out on TikTok. And that's one of the reasons they want to ban it. Uh, mm. But yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, uh, what goes on in their heads, these, um, Israeli leaders, the fact that they can, they think they can do this and get away with it. I mean, never again can they kind of claim to be victims of the Holocaust anymore. I mean, people no. will always throw it up. People well, will... it, it, it's important, I, th I think, to maintain, you know, that, that there, there is this difference between Zionists and most Israelis are, are, are Zionists. And Jews, because because my Jewish friends who do not yeah. support Israel, who want nothing to, to to do with it, they see themselves as British, you know, just as I see myself as British as as well. Yeah. So, and and I think it's interesting on all these demonstrations. There's always a Jewish contingent. You know, they're always making clear this isn't about being Jewish. This is a political thing. It's the state of Israel. It's a political ideology, Zionism. And they're using, they're sort of hiding behind world um, jury to to do these things. I, no, I think, you. yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just agreeing with you. I think we need to separate Zionism from Judaism. Yeah. No, I agree, yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, I, I have a lot of um, Israeli friends as well. They're absolutely horrified as well. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm blaming the leadership here, and especially all the... Also, a lot of the IDF um, members who are going around posting videos and really distasteful videos. Um, I'm not going to describe it here, but, mm. you know. I, I'd like to know how many IDF members are deserting. I, I bet you there's a few. Oh, yeah. Mm, I wonder as well. But, do mm. the, you know, the fact that Israel stopped, the, it, the DNA test kits are banned in Israel. They're not allowed to... to to test their, their DNA, is that right? Oh, yeah. Someone can confirm confirm that. Why not? Because they I, might find they're Palestinians, or they might find that they have no link to the indigenous population at all. Maybe that could possibly be that mm. they are European of, after all. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I think I think this conflict has also got rid of Israel's kind of uh, invincibility factor because uh, the whole of the Middle East were kind of like intimidated by Israel because this goes back to, you know, 
the Yom Kippur War and the Six Day War, where Israel back then, you know, did a decisive victory, and all the Middle Eastern countries, even coming together, couldn't take it on. But I think I think Israel's lost that. Where they can't even take down a bunch of you know Hamas members who are kind of hiding under the tunnels, making homemade rocket launchers and bombs. And it's been six months now, and and they still haven't been able to take control of it. And but um, how many of the kids, how many of the Palestinian kids who who survive are looking at this and are going to go straight into Hamas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do, you do? Exactly. What do you do if you've if you've been on the receiving end of this? Yeah, which is a proportion of your young life is a huge amount. Do you, what on earth are you expected to do? Mm. Yeah, these young kids a... lost, lost their families and they've got nothing yeah. else. You know, they've, 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 all the universities have been blown up. There's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing no, to lose. Yeah, all, all the, everything's blown up in the Gaza. There's nothing there. I mean, as a kid growing up, you've got, you've got no, no education, no schools, because everything's blown up. What are you going to do? You're just going to turn to Hamas. I agree. So, in fact, everything that's going on now is probably the best recruiting tool. Yeah, I mean, it's not just in um, Gaza, but recruiting tool to, in the rest of the Middle East as well. I mean, the Muslims are enraged. I mean, you just have to look, go into Twitter and you see all the Muslims like uh, on these Twitter spaces and stuff. They're absolutely enraged. Um, you know, it's just like, um, and they, they are hating the West for it. They don't, they don't just blame Israel. They blame USA and Britain as well. And, Quite uh, rightly. Uh, yeah, well, well, Britain considered it was, um, oh, what's it called? Palestine was a British uh, what, protectorate. Is, it, is that right? Yeah, the, the Balfour Declaration, go wow. back to the 1917, wow. 18, I think that was, or 1912. It was certainly more than 100 years ago where Balfour decided this is the way it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the problem with the United States is, is it's just the. Um, the lobbying system. I think they should just ban lobbying altogether in, in the United States because the, the APAC lobby is the biggest and most powerful lobby. Um, you have people like, um, you know, you see, you know, all the, all the CIA leaders like Mike Pompeo going to Israel, dancing with the troops, and you have um, JFK Jr., you know, you see him kind of uh, hug, hug, going to Israel and hugging shoulders with it's a shmuley or something and um, all, all of them have been kind of paid by APAC in some way or rather even Biden or even Trump as well um, yep. I think APAC has become way too powerful it's just running the American policy and I think if APAC wasn't there America would would be a much better country with a much better more consistent foreign policy uh, and human rights would be all about human rights, not pick and choose to who are your friends. And, you know, but yeah, it's just. Um... That is a big problem. You've got Human Rights Watch, which uh, effectively paid for by Soros. They're one of the few that are saying that because uh, Soros doesn't like Israel and Human Rights Watch got 100 million pounds or 100 million dollars from from him. And and they're the ones criticizing Israel. The rest of them are all following the the American uh, narrative that uh, Israel has a right of self defense. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, for Even years, the United Nations. Yeah, for for years they've been banging on the drum, saying, "Oh, we care about human rights." Even the Europeans, like von der Leyen, he always bangs on about human rights, but she's the first one to go to Israel and say, "Yeah, Israel's got right to defend themselves." and they can do whatever they want. And she, she's quiet now. She doesn't say anything. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's not just the Americans, it's the Europeans, the British. Um, I mean, there is an APAC in UK as well. I think it's called Friends of Labour and Friends of Tories. I think that's what the, um, that lobby is called in the UK. I'm losing you now in terms of sound. I don't know if it's my end or your end, AJ. I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, hang on. Is that better? I think I like said it. The, I the answer that. is no. It could be my end, but it's it also could be oh. that uh, we've been we've been here for three and nearly three and a half hours. And oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. We we better put, put it. 
Yeah, we're all going to get thrombosis if we don't move. <laughs> okay, well, well, let's uh, finish up, actually. Um, but I think uh, we we have come to a close. I, 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 normally, after each, at the end of my shows, I, I normally have this um, kind of a, a funny piece, um, uh, kind of an idiot of the day um, article. And... And I wanted to kind of share this with you before we go. So we have Kushida here, basically in in United States, and and you can see the the title of the article it says uh, Japanese Prime Minister apologized to the Americans that they had to nuke Japan. So I mean, this is um this is a puppet, um, and his approval ratings has gone down to like sixteen percent or something. It's really really low. And he's he's going around to America. He's he's he, uh, and he, he's talking about Russia nuking Ukraine, and he has no mention of of what America did to Japan. And, and it's just, um, I mean, I, I've been to Japan, guys. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've I've actually spoken to like a few youngsters in Japan. There are people in Japan who believe that um, the nukes uh, didn't happen at all. It's fake news. Um, and there's others that believe that Godzilla did it. I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, <laughs> this is how brainwashed some you know, they've made the Japanese. I mean, I've, I've talked to youngsters who, who actually think that, you know, the um, nuking of Japan is just a fantasy. So I've, they've done a really great job in brainwashing the youngsters. And, you know, they, they probably got rid of it from all the kind of textbooks and stuff. But a lot of youngsters, uh, they think, you know, they heard about it, but they don't think it's true and stuff. But... Um, but yeah, final thoughts on Kishida? Oh, just go for Anna, go first. No, no, I don't. What, what can I add? I think every, everyone's seen right through him. You know, every, all, all the comments about him are absolutely um, right. I'm just wondering what Jap Japanese are supposed to be such a proud nation. What on earth are they making of this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they were a very proud nation. Samurais are supposed to be very proud people, and you know, if if, if they do anything shameful like this, they would, you know, back in the day, they would cause um, that. That I don't know what they call it when they put the knife inside them and, and cut themselves. Harakiri. Yeah, Harakiri. Yeah, and, when they do anything yeah, oh, shameful. Another term. Sorry. Um, yeah. Seppuku. seppuku. Seppuku, yeah, Seppuku. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, he, he's just there like, oh my God, it's, it's just, oh look. Uh, one, of the, the, yeah, one on. of the most disappointing things that I saw about this was the fact that he stood in front of a crowd of American lawmakers and said, you know, we don't want to see nuclear bombs used again in Ukraine. And Yeah, yeah, his, his wording, that, that, exactly. The he, the word the wording of his statement was effectively as if Russia did it, and not the people that he was talking to or their predecessors, uh, and that was probably the most disappointing thing of all. And and it, it really, Chinese people would be looking at that and going, "Wow, <laughs> don't they know?" Uh, so yeah, no, he, he's he's lost a lot of respect here. It is brainwashing, and it's taking advantage of an un undereducated uh, popul populace. Um, by the way, I left a, a message. Could you, um, in in your uh, Twitter, AJ? In my Twitter. Yeah, in in DMs. Okay. Because everything everything I, I'm putting in here that, that has any link is just being blanked out. Oh really? I don't know why that is. Um, mm. My Twitter's on my. Can you send me a private message and I'll put it on here? You can send yeah, me a private DMs. message. Yeah, on DMs. What on here? Yeah, on uh, here. Yeah, you can send all right, me. Okay. I think there's a way to just send me like a private message. Oh yeah, got it. Oh, uh, there's one. That, 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 that's yeah, one. I'll post that. So oh, that's yeah. So we, we've had like up to around 450 average um, viewers today. So it's, it's been very successful, guys. Oh, um, really appreciate you taking your time uh, to chat with us. It's been a very entertaining chat uh, discussion, and. Um, Always a pleasure, and um, we should do it again. Um, and uh, Jerry, uh, I think we make a good team. And um, let me just post your links up. 
but yeah, th thanks for like taking up your Saturdays and uh, to kind of chat with us. But how, it's, it's been a uh, pleasure. The, the things I, we I've, talked about is important, you know. It's very. I'm losing every second word that you're saying right now. So uh, I know that we're wrapping up here. So I sure. just wanted to say thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Anna, and I will see Anna online yeah, next week. Yeah, no, very enjoyable. Thank you, mm. and, and uh, I'm glad Jerry was on here. He's so so informative. I mean, really brilliant. Brilliant understanding. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Anna. I posted your links, by the way, so everyone should see it. Make sure you follow Anna, go to her website and stuff, uh, read her articles. Very, very interesting. Um, I was reading your review, yes, um, I think yesterday or day before. Very, very good. You're a very talented writer, and I, and I know you. I know you've done a lot of stuff in TV and theatre and stuff. But yes, yeah, thank very you very good. much. And there's there's the review. That's the review link there. Yeah. So okay, thank let me, let me... you for inviting me. Um, and next time I'll know that you, you, you're doing this in on video now. Yeah. So what? Why? Um... Obviously, I've got two different audiences. I've got one on YouTube and I've got one on Twitter as well. So right. they're both separate, really, um, because I think some people prefer Twitter, other people prefer YouTube. Right. Um, but well, the quality of this is it's, it's really impressive. So I'm going to chat to you at some point. About, but, yeah, um, no problem. No problem. But yeah, it's good to kind of um, get you guys together, get your thoughts. Uh, really appreciate it. So yeah, thanks again, Anna. And thanks again, Jerry. Uh, Thank we you. Should we should definitely do this again. I'll see you next time. No worries. No Lovely. worries. All right. Bye, Thanks a lot. Ben. Bye. Bye.